Jutro, lepo pozdravljeni, da se slišimo. Dobrodošli na posvetu krčenja prostora civilne družbe. Moje ime je Tina Peternel in bom danes povezovala ta nad vse zanimiv in pomemben dogodek, ki glede na to, kaj vse se dogaja okoli nas, se odvija ob zares pravem času. In ko je govora o času, se sama veliko krat spomnim na rek, ali pa morda preklestvo, may you live in interesting times, da bi živeli v zanimivem času. In zagotovo živimo v zanimivem obdobju, ko se Evropa pred nami, pred našimi očmi spreminja in se v bistvu ne samo na vzven zapira, ampak se tudi na vznoter sama proti sebi mnogo kje obrača in se obrača proti svojim vitalnim delom. In to civilna družba zagotovo zelo občuti, ravno na svoji koži. In o čem pravzaprav govorimo, ko omenjamo civilno družbo? To je prostor izven družine, države, trga, kjer se posamezniki srečujejo, srečujemo in se zauzemamo za skupne interese. In ta prostor je v bistvu mnogo širši kot samo nevladne organizacije. To je prostor posameznikov, je prostor razno raznih društev združen, tudi verskih organizacij, sindikatov in ravno skozi to širino, ki jo civilna družba ima preko svojih uporabnikov in sodelujočih, lahko ugotavlja nepravilnosti v sistemu, jih zaznava in na njih opozarja. In ravno zaradi tega je civilna družba eden izmed temeljev demokratične družbe. In posamezniki skupnosti organizacije civilne inicijative, ki opozarjajo na te nepravilnosti v sistemu, se vse pogosteje znajdejo pod napadom, pod kritikami. Prostor sodelovanja teh organizacij, teh posameznikov se torej krči. In najprej smo še nekako odaleč spremljali, kako se v Evropi dogajajo te spremembe in kako se ta prostor krči izven Slovenije. Naprimer, od zakona za javno varnost v Španiji, s katerim so z zelo visokimi finančnimi in tudi zapornimi kaznimi probali utišati vse bolj glasno civilno inicijativo, ki se je oglašala in aktivirala proti nepravilnostim sistema. Pa do odkritih napadov polske vlade na sodstvo in na medije, s katerimi so hoteli prav tako podrejati neodvisne vse, neodvisne organizacije, v bistvu trenutni politični volji. In do vse pogostejših primerov vzakonjenih zahtev, da se tuje nevladne organizacije v državah prijavijo kot tuji agenti. Ter seveda do sosednje Mađarske, kjer so uporabi vsi ti mehanizmi, pa še kakšen več. In če smo nekaj časa mislili, da se to vrstno krčenje prostora ne dogaja v Sloveniji ali pa da se vsaj dogaja v veliko manjši meri, se je konec letošnjega poletja zgodila zgodba okoli Magne. In zdaj lahko odkrito rečemo, da je tudi Slovenija na nekakšnem križišču poti za civilno družbo. In danes smo tu, ker nas zanima, ali bo šla Slovenija po poti Mađarske in številnih ostalih držav, ki organizacije civilne družbe in civilne inicijative enačijo s tujimi vohuni in državnimi sovražniki, ali pa bo šla po poti skandinavskih držav, kjer civilna družba pomembno prispeva k iskanju rešitev. Zato z današnjim dogodkom želimo temo krčenja prostora za civilno družbo postaviti pod žaromete in jo tam pustiti, dokler se vloga civilne družbe ne okrepi. In z gosti se bomo med drugim pogovarjali danes o pomenu civilne družbe kot enem od temeljih stebrov demokracije, o tem, zakaj in kako zaščititi njen prostor delovanja in kako zagotoviti, da bodo predpisi o demokratičnih procesih, o sodelovanju javnosti ter varovanju človekovih pravic in okolja spoštovanji. V prvem delu posveta bomo slišali tri goste iz Tuine, ki nam bodo predstavili trende v Evropi in kako leti vplivajo na celotno družbo. V drugem delu po odmoru pa bomo skozi razpravo, v katero se boste upamo vključili tudi vi, z domačimi in tuji gosti razmišljali o krčenju prostora civilne družbe v Sloveniji, kakšni so trendi, 
kaj se lahko naučimo iz primerov v tujini in kako zaščititi civilno družbo kot temeljni steber demokracije. Preden zagrizamo v vsebino, mogoče še nekaj informacij, nekatere predstavitve bodo potekale v angleščini, ampak na voljo je simultano prevajanje, pri vhodu lahko vzamete slušalke, Bomo pa tudi prevajali iz slovenščine v angleščino našim tujim gostom, tako da vprašanje lahko zastavite v slovenščini in bodo prevedeno. Še nekaj besed o dogodku samem. Dogodek so organizirajo Fokus Društvo za sonoraven razvoj, Umanotera, Slovenska fundacija za trajnostni razvoj in ekologi brez meja. Dogodek je nastal v okviru projekta Financiranje za razvoj, ki ga finančno podpirata Evropska unija, in Ministrstvo za zunanje zadeve Republike Slovenije. Zato njegova vsebina je v domeni organizatorjev in ne odraža mnenja Evropske unije in Ministrstva za zunanje zadeve. Je bilo treba povedati. Ne odraža nujno v polni veri mogoče, ampak ja. Tako da za začetek nekaj uvodnih besed predajam so predstavnici so organizatorjev, Gaj Brecev, direktorci Umanotere. Gaj. Hvala Tina. Lepo pozdravljeni. Ja, zakaj smo se organizacije odločile, da organiziramo ta posvet in zakaj prav zdaj? Zakaj se nam zdi pomembno, da odpremo debato o tem, o debato o krčenju prostora civilne družbe? Zato, ker po svetu v Evropi in v Sloveniji opažamo trende, ki omejujo demokracijo in so škodljive za družbo. In preprosto, zato, ker je to naša dožnost, da na to odreagiramo. Okoljski in družbeni aktivisti so vse bolj pod odarom, tako v nedemokratičnih, kot tudi v demokratičnih državah. Pritiski prihaja v obliku preopraševanja legitimnosti civilne družbe, marsi, ki je pa se ne ustrašijo niti fizičnih napadov na aktiviste. V poročilu Global Witness za leto 2016 lahko preberemo, da po svetu vsak teden obijajo štiri okoljske aktiviste, samo zato, ker se borijo za pitno vodo, čist zrak, rodovitno zemljo. Na ravni veri so, bolj kot kdarkoli prej, postali predmet brezkompromisnega izkoriščanja in grabljenja multinacionalk, ki pa ga vlade dopuščajo. Fokus v okviru projekta Financiranje za razvoj poroča o številnih primerih pritiskov na civilno družbo, o mongolskih pastirjih, ki jim rudniki za izkoriščanje različnih naravnih bogatstv ogrožajo preživetje, o zatiranju gruzijskih vaščanov, ki jim bodo jezovi za hidroelektrarne uničili vasi, o zaprtih aktivistih, ki so si drznili postavljati vprašanja o nedemokratičnem režimu azerbejdžanskega predsednika. Pa da ne bi mislili, da moramo opisane trende iskati samo v oddaljenih državah. Sploh ne, lahko se preselimo bliže. V Bosno in Hercegovino ali v Makedonijo kjer Slovenija preko tako imenovanega razvojnega sodelovanja podpira rudnike premoga, kljub na sportovanju lokalnih aktivistov. Guardian skupaj s preomenjeno Global Witness poroča o že več kot 160 mrtvih okoljskih in družbenih aktivistih v letošnjem letu. Pri nas, lahko rečemo v sreči, se to dogaja bolj olikano, z grožnjami, tožbami in blatenjem tistih, ki se temu zoprstavijo. Letos smo okoljske nevladne organizacije to občutile na lastni koži, pa čeprav smo ravnale popolnoma v skladu z zakonsko predelenimi pravicami. Ko smo upozorile na nepravilnosti ob sprejemanju tako imenovanega Lex Magna in vlado pravočasno pozvale naj diskriminatorni zakon o makne z dnevnega reda, nas je minister za gospodarstvo javno označil za ekoteroriste. Ko smo se na ta nedostojni odnos odzvale z javnim pozivom, še do danes nismo prejeli jasnega in javnega upravičila strani predstavnikov vlade. A to je bil samo začetek. Saj danes razumemo, da ta oblika napadalnega govora pomeni sindrom delovanja družbe in razmišljanja tistih, ki bi glede na svoj položaj morali zastopati interese državljanov in interese okolja. Ob tem se poraja neprijetno spoznanje, da je državni aparat veliko bolj dojemljiv za interese posameznih podjetij, kot pa za interese svojih državljanov in celotne družbe ter organizacije, ki te interese zastopajo v zato predvidenih postopkih. Pravico in dožnost nevladnih organizacij, da varujejo javni interes v okoljskih prizadevanih, so v primeru Magna grobo in neokusno poteptali nosilci moči, pristojne javne institucije pa svoje vloge niso ustrezno opravili. 
priča smo bili spremani ob vodne zakonodaje po hitrem postopku, brez možnosti razprave, zastraševanje s politikov izvršenih dejstev, izključevanju civilne družbe, izsiljevanju in izvajanju pritiskov pod pretvezo rokov, javni goni na podlagi skrbno klasiranih neresnic, populizmom in hujskanju, ustrahovanju, diskreditiranju, brez sramnemu lobiranju predstavnikov vlade za interese tujega sasebnega olagatolja in goni proti nevladnim organizacijam, kakršni doslejši nismo bili priča. Vklanjanje politik in zakonodaje parcijalnim interesom nosilcev kapitala in to ravnanje oblasti nas je kot pravno državo in kot demokratično, civilizirano, konstruktivno, dialoško, argumentirano družbo porinilo nekaj desetletji nazaj, kar je zelo, zelo nevarno. Ta odkriti pogrom nad okoljskimi nevladnimi organizacijami je nevaren preceden za prihodnost delovanja celotnega nevladnega sektorja v Sloveniji, ki lahko vodi v nevarne trende, kakršnim smo že pričali v nekaterih državah, članicah Evropske unije. In ne verjamemo, da je to smer družbenega razvoja, ki jo želimo obrati v Sloveniji. Danes bomo slišali, kaj se nam celotni družbi obeta, če se ne bomo postavili temu porobu. Iz prve roke bomo slišali izkušnje iz Mađarske in iz Turčije, kjer so civilno družba tako rekoč zradirali iz družbenega polja delovanja. Pred le nekaj meseci je poslanec nemške stranke Merklove CDU v Evropski parlament vložil predlog, po katerem naj bi nevladne organizacije, kot pogoj za prejem kakršnih koli sredstev v strani Evropske unije, podpisale izjavo, da ne bodo nasprotovale politikam, za katere se zauzema EU. Povedano drugače, organizacija, ki bo upozarjala na okolju in ljudem škodljive politike in mehanizme, bo onemogočena. Ali povedano še drugače, organizacije civilne družbe naj postanejo trobilo oblastniških odločitev, če tudi so te škodljive. Ameriški predsednik Theodore Roosevelt je to dobro razumel. Saj je rekel, če ga citiram, pozivi, da predsednika ni dovoljeno kritizirati ali da mu je treba stati ob strani ne glede na vse, niso le nedomoljubni, ampak pomenijo tudi moralno izdajo ameriškega ljudstva. Ja, naša državanska dožnost in ne le pravica je, da se zoprstavimo vladnimi politikam, ki jih predpostavljamo in prepoznavamo kot napačne in etično sporne. Zato je današnji posvet krčenje prostora civilne družbe obenem tudi poziv k skupnim prizadevanjem za širjenje prostora civilne družbe. Ker močna civilna družba pomeni več demokracije, več solidarnosti, več participacije, več pravičnosti, več moči za šipkejše, več nadzora nad oblastjo in izvajanjem politik, več sodelovanja in več okoljske in družbene odgovornosti. Hvala. Hvala, Gaja. Če se do zdaj v polnosti nismo mogoče zavedali resnostni položaja, nam je zdaj sigurno malo bolj jasno. In še bolj jasno nam bo postalo z vsemi naslednjimi vloški naših gostov. In prvi bo vložek Franka Barata iz organizacije Transnational Institute, ki žal ni mogel biti z nami, ampak si bomo njegov kratek Hi everyone, um, my name is uh, Frank Barrett, I work at the uh, Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. Firstly, I'd like to apologize for not being able to be with you today, but I'm glad that I get the chance to um, you know, give you a brief introduction in the work that TNI has been doing. I'll try to be very short because I know this uh, video, you know, um, recorded video presentation can be quite annoying and boring, so I'll try to make this exciting. So um, the work of TNI in terms of shrinking space uh, started about a year ago when we published um, a paper ident identifying the current trends in uh, shrinking space for civil society. Uh, we've identified uh, 10 trends and I'll just list them quickly um, for you now. Obviously if you want to know more, um, check our website uh, tni.org um, where you find the, the paper, uh, the more detailed you know, paper online. So um, there's brands like philanthropic protectionism. We've identified obviously domestic laws that uh, are re regulating activities um, of non-profits. Um, there's also policies and practices that uh, are imposing restrictions on the right to freedom 
an assembly um, of association. Uh, there's the criminalization, dehumanization, and delegitimization of human rights defenders. We've identified also the restriction of freedom of expression in general and online, uh, of intimidations and attacks against civil society by far right uh, corporations and non state actors are more and more frequent nowadays. Um, and we've seen also a decreasing space for online activism. Um, another trend is the capture of spaces that are traditionally inhabited uh, by uh, civil society organizations, by uh, private interest groups, lobbyists, and government oriented NGOs. And finally, we see more and more often the exclusion of civil society organizations from the banking system under the guise of counter-terrorism measures. And this is a trend, um, especially this one, that we, we've seen um, happening more and more also throughout Europe. Uh, I just wanted to mention also that these papers and these trends we've, uh, we've, um, we've I've just talked about where um, after consultation with many groups and many different sort of activists from actually all over the world during a meeting, uh, a closed workshop we held in Berlin in October 2016. So this was from a consultation with various uh, activists and uh, civil society organizations. So what are we doing now um, as TNI? We first tried to organize, uh, to organize this type of um, short meetings, uh, short closed meetings and, and workshops um, for people to be able to share the stories. And we think it's a very important point. And people often feel they are isolated and they are the only one victims of, what, of what's happening to them uh, and they don't know what to do about it. So the first step was for us to put these people together in the same space where they could uh, share the stories with other people. And we've experienced like a really um, interesting sort of moments where people from various parts of the world um, were realizing that what was happening to them was happening to others in other parts of the world, maybe in different ways, but that the trend and the pattern of um, repression was the same. So sharing these stories uh, was very important. Um, and the next step for us was also to identify 10, 15, 20 of these stories, or case studies, if you want to call them this way, and to go talk to the people that are first, you know, the first victims of repression, so the people really on the front lines, the people that are fighting for the land, that are fighting for the, the survival. Because what we think at TNI is important to do is, um, is to give these people a voice, and we think that People that have struggled for 10, 15, 20 years against the state, against the corporations, are the best place to defend themselves and to know how to defend themselves and to know what type of solidarity we show we should um, show them. So we've, we've experienced, you know, we have organized such meetings in Berlin, Amsterdam, Brussels, in Rome, in Hamburg during the G20, and we've, um, we've started talk, you know, working on, uh, on art articles that you can find also online at tni.org uh, and a couple of, uh, of papers around the criminalization of refugee solidarity. We're working also a paper on the criminalization of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, which is a movement um, that targets Israel. Uh, and, and we're going to work on, on more and more papers in the, coming, in the forthcoming months. Um, I, again, I'm trying to be short and I'm missing a lot of things, so please do check our website and hopefully we'll be able to meet up properly um, one day. Um, what can be done? I think working together is a crucial point. Um, big NGOs, smaller groups, uh, charities, uh, movements, if, um, you know, if allowed, we should be able to sort of work together, strategize together and have a, a common front and a, and a common uh, and a common action points um, to be able to, to defeat uh, the what's happening in terms of the really uh, the really shrinking space. But I mean, when we talk about shrinking space, I think you know the, the more political word would be the repression, the violence exerted towards um, human rights defenders, activists, and civil society organisations. So to have common goals and actions and to show solidarity with the ones that we need the most is, is something crucial that we've tried to do in the last uh, year or so. Also, we're trying through those meetings and, and workshops 
to build a network of solidarity, but also of knowledge. And um, because different groups um, we would have different tactics on how to respond to, to violence and repression uh, that they can then share with others. So having this you know, sort of pool of knowledge uh, uh, put together and is very important and can be very useful for, for various groups around the world. Um, I'm not sure how long I've spoken for, uh, but I'm going to conclude by saying that even though um, states, corporations, and, and often the media is trying to demonize us uh, and, and also make us feel isolated, we, we are seeing more and more that, that we're not isolated, that there are a lot of us around, uh, that we are actually the 99%, uh, and that um, by being united and uh, by um, showing solidarity with, with each other, we can actually um, we can actually make, make a difference and, and, um, and hopefully build uh, a better society and a better future for, for, the, you know, for the next generations. So um, uh, thank you again. I hope this was sort of, um, hope you, you, um, you know, was sort of clear, even if it's hard for me to just speak um, to my uh, iPhone. I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Той е бил Франк Берат из организация Transnational Institute. За като му ни било приятно говори само в свой iPhone, му бомо па предали да сме го звеселим и заниманием послушали в данашнем посвету. Франк е поударил по мен солидарности в часу репресия и наша наследня гостя по заготово имела кое споведати туди на то тема. Знам и е Дора Пап, директорица фундация Кретакор ki že 23 let organizira kampanje, festivale, predstave. Vzpostavili pa so tudi medijsko platformo na Mađarskem. Dora kot aktivistka naslavlja družbene in kulturne teme z namenom prispevati k družbi. In je tudi so avtorica publikacija o mađarski civilni družbi. In danes bo z nami delila izkušnje delovanja v vse bolj omejenem prostoru za civilno družbo na Mađarskem. Dora, Oder, Irvash, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I think I have to keep this because there will be questions later. Uh, I just complied a really short summary of uh, what's going on about in Hungary and um, and I think the, m the most important message for, for all of us in Europe is that what is going on in Hungary or in Poland or what we are threatened of seeing in Turkey or, or Russia or in any other countries is that uh, it can happen here. So it can happen anywhere else because uh, authoritarian regimes are not um, located to one point in the world. Uh, there are some symptoms, there are processes in, in society which lead to, to um, control, really, really uh, disturbing control. And what we can see uh, in Hungary is the same, that uh, six years ago I wouldn't, or, uh, or most of the people wouldn't think that this will happen. But uh, right now, uh, after after these uh, short years, we can we can see that uh, already uh, controlling of uh, the media, uh, really harsh uh, corruption cases, and and um, yeah, well, we can say that we are beyond the rule of law already, um, and we did not left the EU. So um, just just a quick introduction how uh, to slide into into uh, a democratic crisis um, um, following the case of Hungary um, yeah this this is the first picture that you might have already seen this was a demonstration in in Hungary uh, I just um, brought this picture to show you that there is hope uh, a few thousand people gathering and um, 
at the first part of my presentation, I am going to focus on um, the previous three few years, what led to the current situation. Uh, this is the case of the media in Hungary. Uh, we already belong, I, I cannot really show you, but y you will see that we already belong to the partly free part of, uh, <coughs> of uh, with the freedom of press. The problem with this is that this was in 2016, and since 2016, um, uh, most of the free media was bought out by pro-government um, um, interests. Um, um, companies in in Hungary, so we are we are sliding to, towards the not free zone already. Um, Why the struggle of of um, civic or, uh, organizations and and uh, problems with civic space uh, can be seen here with, with to, uh, between 2013 and 16. These are really concrete uh, happenings, really concrete events, but uh, we can go way back from, from 2010 uh, also, so some of, some of the examples you can see there. Um, these are the pictures, these are some, some uh, of those uh, uh, happened uh, since 2014. For example, in April, the Prime Minister's office claims political influ influence regarding the EAE, EEA and Norway grants. I think you must have heard about it uh, and the, EEA, the Norway mechanism, uh, how it works. It was one of the biggest um, independent funding in <coughs> Hungary. Why it is important? Because uh, there is no other uh, uh, funding that was independent from the government uh, at all. Because uh, after 2010, all the grants, all the uh, all the resources were uh, centralized and were uh, and uh, already controlled by the government. Uh, that uh, worries. Before that, uh, also in 2013, you can see that uh, NGOs have been named as um, organizations serving foreign interests in Hungary. And uh, also, uh, back to 2014, May, um, there were several state audits launched against civil organizations uh, in Hungary. After two years, the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union um, uh, managed to get the documentation from 2014 that the Prime Minister himself, so Mr. Orban, ordered the investigation ag uh, against the NGOs. I'm leading Kritiker Foundation. This is one of the organizations where not this uh, uh, campaign against the NGOs, but uh, a few months later, in 2014, started the first tax investigation, tax audit, that was uh, for a two-year, uh, that was for a three-year period uh, between 2012 and uh, 2014, and the, the investigation itself lasted for two years. We got back all the documentation of or or a content uh, a contency after two uh, two uh, massive years um, several other other happenings also there was a police raid you can see one of uh, one of the uh, EEA grand consortium leader um, it, it's an organization called Ecotan. she um, you can see Veronica Mura um, she was, uh, yeah, yeah, the organization was under police raid in 2014 and, and uh, she was taken away by the police to her home to bring all her uh, laptops and uh, that can be taken as evidence against the NGO. In 2014, when when text, when text audit was launched, um, uh, also there was a threat uh, that NGO la leaders account uh, will be investigated for uh, yeah, the, pr uh, the uh, personal assets and uh, in 2016 all these uh, investigations ended without uh, any results or investigation, I mean critical investigation ended in 2017 so we were, uh, yeah, we were enjoying this investigation for 
for a bit longer than other NGOs. Um, uh, why we had these investigations? Because Creator Care Foundation was active in, in mobilizing people and active also in the cultural sector protesting against uh, the, the centralization of funding uh, and also um, the freedom of press, freedom of media, freedom of association. And we also were involved in uh, in uh, organizing uh, uh, um, the the protest of uh, <coughs> NGOs and the protest of civic sphere. Uh, this is one of my just to be back into some positive vibes. Uh, this is one of my um, most. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I re really like this picture because this was about the tax investigation. It is, it is uh, about, it is in Hungarian, but um, yeah, how how you can defeat the problems uh, like this is this is humor you can use uh, all the time when your home is already investigated. Uh, there is there is one more thing left that you can use sarcasm or humor. Um, I just brought this as, as a kind of an in instruction. In 2016, we can go back further. Uh, also, you can see the uh, reports. Also, in uh, 2016, the listing of NGOs. Uh, these were threats that you can see in the first slide. And uh, also, there was a rumor about a, s a suspicious device uh, that uh, one of the NGOs were bought. And in 2016, there was also uh, another threat that there will be a state uh, audit uh, against um, NGOs again. And in 2016, the so the so-called um, really infa and really infamous NGO uh, law was uh, first mentioned by the government. So we so it led to 2017, where um, in February. You can see that the Prime Minister uh, uh, announced, uh, announced the first national consultation on foreign influencing and this led to the NGO law basically uh, demonstrating, um, NGOs uh, demonstrating against it uh, throughout the whole spring and summer. Uh, just some of the examples how this propaganda is uh, working because uh, it's really, really visible. I mean, how uh, the government is using propaganda as a, uh, an anti NGO propaganda as a tool to ga gain votes and also to threaten people that anyone who is not pro governmental um, should be threatened and, and uh, should. Uh, should really fear uh, of of uh, of uh, of bringing public their opinion. Uh, these are what I'm yeah uh, holding in my hand. This is um, a national consultation questionnaire brought to every home in Hungary. It was in spring, and since then uh, another consultation arrived. I'm going to show you the questions that uh, this is in every household in, uh, in, in Hungary. So a lot of money is spent on propaganda and nobody can really defeat it because no one has the, ref the resources as the government and no one has, you could see the, the situation of uh, media as well, no one has the same resources and no one has the same national coverage. And uh, as, as uh, the, uh, the government in Hungary, this this national consultation that I'm holding right now in my hand, some of the questions are translated into English. Uh, this is the second this year. So yeah, the government has a lot of time to consult with us, even though they are really not interested in r uh, real questions. Uh, you can see how many times, for example, Shorash is, is mentioned among the questions. Some of the NGOs were also listed not in these uh, questions, but but uh, so you can see a question and there's some of a plus information to help you decide whether you want to uh, exclude some of these people from the society or not. Um, but I think, I think it's really visible and it's really clear what is happening if you would like to, if you would like to exclude somebody from society. Uh, the government has um, really good tools that they can use. I uh, brought also the so-called map of fear. 
because it's not just the NGOs and it's not just um, Open Society Institute and, and Mr. Shrush uh, who are the so-called threats of the nations, but also individuals were named. Uh, and this propaganda uh, began in 2015 with the migration crisis when uh, the first time uh, ever uh, people arrived as uh, refugees and asylum seekers in, in Hungary. This video I won't show you, but you can check it on YouTube. This is a message to illegal uh, immigrants from Hungary. This is one of the best examples of how propaganda works and how you, you can make a propaganda video. Uh, showing the countryside, mm -hmm. police just uh, trying to protect the country and the really forceful and the really powerful major in the country with yeah in a village like 200 people trying to pr uh, protect Europe from immigrants and uh, <coughs> and uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers and giving out the message like this you should not come to Hungary because we are going to protect us um, this propaganda is working and it's really really bad um, this e the effects of it you can see uh, of how many things people fear of in Hungary. So the first video and uh, the crisis, the first propaganda uh, started in 2015 uh, and in 2017 you can see how many things people fear of in Hungary. Migrants, Mr. Soros, foreign funded NGOs, the European Union, uh, Russia and the United States. Yeah, which is really insane um, being yeah fear to, to fear of the European Union uh, when we are part of it and we are fighting Brussels these questionnaires that I show you one of the first um, uh, questionnaire was about stop Brussels but I think you must have heard about it this is a case uh, against Hungary in the European Parliament so you can see that the people are really afraid of foreign funded NGOs and uh, the European Union, which is, um, which is a really, really good case to see that, um, that also people trust NGOs more than parties ever, uh, than, than political parties. So it is, it is a kind of a um, um, ha how it happened. So it's really the propaganda that is working. And there are a lot of people who don't really know um, what NGOs actually do in Hungary. Um, and what we can do is um, basically, based on the last uh, years of working in this uh, environment, is that we need counter-narratives. So the, the only solution is uh, counter-narratives, because you won't have um, that media coverage, uh, that media co uh, that, that the government has, but there are campaigning tools that that uh, NGOs can use. And I'm going to show you some of these from Hungary. Um, one of them was Real National Consultation by Kretaker. This was, uh, this was really a successful campaign video of the founder of, of, um, of Kretaker, Mr. Um, Arpad Schilling. He was recording a video at home. Um, to more than two million people see the video in Hungarian and, and in English. Yeah. After that, we launched a selfie campaign asking people uh, to, to react on the national consultation of Hungary because we thought that the questions of the consultation are fake. They are used for propaganda and we really would like to know what, they, what, what bothered them. So just to, just to have a clear view, what are the problems in Hungary? And um, in most cases, we received questions and selfies from people stating that they are really they they would like to know uh, what will be with healthcare, uh, how can the problems with education and and uh, and corruption or environmental issues like uh, new, new nuclear power plant in Hungary will be solved. Um, so none of them were about migration or anyone fear of uh, refugees and asylum seekers arriving to, to Hungary. Uh, back to the problem after uh, real nation, uh, after the, uh, or real national consultation or simultaneously to, to this happened that NGOs uh, started to 
uh, feel um, the need of working together against the government propaganda and against uh, the so-called Lex uh, NGO. This was the foreign fun the, the, uh, about the regulation of foreign funded NGOs in Hungary. And this was the first uh, protest letter, open letter of Hungarian NGOs. That there is no civil society. Uh, there is no society without civil society. More than 250 organizations signed this petition. This was the civil heart. Uh, I have a few with them. If you would like to take it in, in uh, uh, to show solidarity with Hungarian organizations. Uh, this was the sign uh, we decided to form uh, as a as a sign of our, our um, platform or, or showing solidarity. And this was the result of this heart, why this heart shape was uh, basically formed. This was a demonstration um, to support uh, Hungarian organizations, uh, civil society organizations. Um, more than fi uh, fi uh, 15,000 people uh, gathered in, in uh, Hero Square in, in Budapest. Uh, this is a statement of these organizations, so solidarity within the country. It's really important to show not just to the organizations, but to people. I mean, uh, the support of society shown towards uh, the organization. You can reach these uh, at um, the website of um, Civ uh, Civilizatio and most of the Hungarian NGOs. and. Uh, and in May, we also visited the parliament to, to stop this, this NGO law. Um, unfortunately, with not a good uh, result, because uh, the NGO came, uh, the, the law uh, passed the parliament uh, a month later. But uh, actually, this was a silent protest and uh, was, uh, was a successful one in that case that um, people tr uh, started to react on the case of NGOs. So even more and more people uh, reached out to NGOs and showed their support afterwards. It was a silent protest uh, in the parliament. And also we can see international solidarity after these actions that are really, really important to NGOs and individuals, I mean to all the, activi all the activists. Uh, this was a petition start, uh, started by Civil Society Europe. And uh, yeah, in, in the picture th uh, you can see this, this petition was signed by 500 signatures and sent to, to Prime Minister Orban. And uh, on the projector here, you can see the letter from uh, Prime Minister Orban sent to Civil Society Europe. This was the only case the, uh, that we know about when, when the Prime Minister answered uh, any petitions at all. And uh, back then, I was in Belgrade, and we organized a um, um, really small solidarity action. A everyone was wearing the civil heart and sending their their uh, warmest regards to to Hungary and also these organizations present at this uh, Belgrade forum uh, started uh, organize uh, solidarity actions in their countries. Um, yeah, they went home and they were protesting um, in front of embassies and in the, and in in front of several offices they knew or in Brussels or, or, or other cases. And uh, also there are other tools that you can use against um, these um, laws or, or to, to support the organizations. Um, one of them was uh, uh, taking action in the European Parliament or starting to taking action in Strasbourg. Uh, uh, several several organizations uh, started to help the Hungarian organizations like Helsinki Committee and and um, the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union or or uh, Amnesty International and um, also other open letters uh, were in public. But um, but unfortunately, I just wanted to come back. Um, um, for a few moments here, uh, just to see as a result of uh, how to protest against um, 
these actions, I, I think it's really important to say that without society, I mean, without the support of people, you are not really able to to reach out to the international media or to inter or any international bodies because also the European Union can can take steps if uh, if they see that people support the case uh, of of uh, the NGOs. Uh, which means in any case that there there should be um, a basic minimum of forming of building communities and building solidarity within the nation and uh, and in all the countries uh, before the panel uh, started we were talking about the Tur uh, the case in Turkey and in Hungary and I uh, I was also in a forum a few weeks ago um, we were talking about Poland and we usually say that we are on the same scale uh, just it's it's the matter of time when we get there. So uh, the, on the on the first scale, uh, on the first uh, level in the scale, there are some problems with democratic issues, and at the end there are detention and uh, people and NGOs named as national threats. We are somewhere uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, sliding towards an, an a real authoritarian uh, regime. But, uh, for example, in Hungary, the case of, of activists being attacked uh, has already happened. So this uh, September, for example, my colleagues and uh, previous members of uh, the organization, uh, previous uh, managing director of the organization, was named as a national threat by the by the government by name and also uh, where you could see this national consultation questionnaire that is uh, sent out by the government uh, gov uh, also organizations were were named so uh, if uh, if pr society if communities cannot really protect these people uh, and these organizations uh, that's um, that's um that's a real danger for for civil society. So we have to uh, take steps uh, towards um, a culture that is that is based on solidarity. Thank you. Maybe you can just wait for a few seconds. Um, Hvala. Imamo par minut, če je kakšno vprašanje za razjasnitev um, med občinstvom. Ne bi radi šli prav v razpravo, ker zato imamo čas kasneje, ampak če je bilo kaj takega med predstavitvi opovedano, kar ni bilo čisto jasno, ali pa bi radi um, mogoče še malo bolj povprašali podrobno. Tako da če je kakšno vprašanje, um, kar na plan zdi. Ne, zgleda, da ne. Looks everything was clear. Thank you. Hvala. Um, še zadnja predstavitev pred odmorom. Hvala. Um, z nami je Anja Olin Pape, ki je podpredsednica Svetovalnega odbora za mlade pri svetu Evrope. Ima deset let izkušen z delom v mladinskih organizacijah, pa tudi z delom na področju državljanskih pravic v mestih Gothenburg in Malmo. Danes bo predstavila pomen civilne družbe na švedskem in poskušala osvetliti, zakaj ima civilna družba na švedskem tradicionalno močno vlogo. Anja, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, how are you feeling? Have you been sitting down very still for a while? Do you maybe want to stand up, turn around and, and sit down again? You okay? All awake? Okay, in 30 minutes there will be a coffee break, just to let you know, so you are prepared. Okay, so uh, as was said, my name is Anja. I'm here from uh, Sweden. I usually work on uh, these topics on a European level these days, but as um, invited here, I will talk about the Swedish civil society. It feels a bit absurd to stand here and talk about sort of the Swedish legislation after the, the presentation that we just heard. The contrast couldn't be 
I think, uh, more extensive. Um, but it's, um, I have a lot to say on the, on the situation in Europe right now. But I think I will save that for, for the panel discussion later and go straight into um, the work that we do in, in the civil society in Sweden. Just to briefly mention the Council of Europe, uh, the Advisory Council on Youth is a consultative body uh, within, the, uh, advi uh, within the Council of Europe uh, that works with civil society and youth issues. It's a co-management system where youth organizations are actually invited and as stakeholders and decision makers within the system of Council of Europe. So that's uh, what I do to my, uh, on a daily basis. Um, but I started uh, within the NGO sector uh, when I was a teenager. I was in a local youth club, uh, and that's where I want to start my story today. Uh, in my local youth club, I was invited to a, a music camp uh, by some friends when I was 13 years old. To add to the story, I'm tone deaf. I cannot sing. There's nothing in my body that has any capacity to do with music whatsoever. But I went to this uh, weekend music camp with my friends because it was a great opportunity to hang out with them and get away from, get away from the house and actually do something. And it turned out that they really needed someone to film them while they were, were performing. And as a matter of fact, I'm a bit better when it comes to cameras than singing. So I found this was sort of my first official role as a camera person, you know, I got some responsibility. I was actually entrusted with a, with a very specific task. And from that day forward, I became very passionate about photography. It was one of my main things that I did uh, during my teenage years. So we started working together and we created this culture bunker. In, my, in the high school that I went to, there was a, a, a sort of a safety bunker, so underneath the school. And we created a creative space out of this. So everything had to be t uh, able to tear down within 48 hours in case of war, uh, which hasn't happened in Sweden in 200 years, basically. But we still needed to be prepared. So in 24 hours or 48 hours, we had to make sure that everything could be teared down in this space. But we still managed to create a photo studio, a recording studio, and also some space for uh, musicians and bands to uh, create music together. With time, this uh, place, this uh, community space, um, was opened up for people, uh, for young people in, in the area where I grew up. And the special part about this um, this project was that we didn't have any staff. There were no adults involved in, in this process. We didn't have any staff within, site, within, the, within the space. Only people who could teach us how to use it, how to use the materials, the cameras, the laptops, the, the technical stuff. But we had keys. We had, so once you had a, like a weekend course in this, in this specific, if you wanted to learn about photography, you could get a free weekend course and then by the end of the weekend, you would sign a contract and you would get a key. And this key you could use to book yourself a time, you could come and go as you wanted. And then by after a year, we had 400 keys. We had 400 young people who had a key to this community space of culture. And we still didn't have any like proper staff, no cameras, no, no one watching us. It was like a, a youth club <coughs> without adults. And of course, we foresaw that we needed a budget to sort of replace things or fix things that would break or uh, replace things that would go missing. But actually, for the first three consecutive years of this project, we could use that money to invest in other activities and especially to create this co-sharing experience of having events where we could all sort of fill a function because people wouldn't destroy things. We had a youth center just a few, blo few blocks away w that would get smashed and hammered and, and sort of broken into every three weeks. But in this space, with 400 young people having unlimited access, it didn't happen. And I think that one of the main um, takeaways from that is that if you entrust young people with sort of the responsibility and the the possibility to run something for themselves, uh, they will also handle it with a lot more care and, and um, ownership. And this happened when I was 15 years old, and this is sort of where 
ba the baseline for my civil society engagement that I've been working on ever since. So, um, to talk about the civil society in Sweden, what I will do for the rest of the presentation is to focus a lot on the local level, because I think that really brings a backbone to why the civil society is where it is in Sweden. I have this quote from Margaret Mee that says, never doubt a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's one of my favorite quotes. It's very cliche and a bit old fashioned, I know that. Um, <laughs> but I think it speaks to us not only um, on a sort of policy making level, but also on a local level for especially young people that I work a lot with. Uh, it has sort of a, a, a feeling to it that also on a local level in your own community, what, however small or big the question is, it's always worth to get self-organized. So now, with the story and the quote, I've made a very proper public speaking introduction, and so you will all remember me, and now we can go into the really fun stuff, which is statistics. This is what I like. Uh, so to start off by thinking about why is civil society so big in Sweden, how come we are so engaged in our, our society? I think, first and foremost, I wanted to introduce you to the amount of coffee that Swedes drink. It's 9.7 kilos per person per year. It's the second highest amount of coffee consumption in the world. I think this is one of the backbones of the Swedish movement, really. <laughs> so that is, I was asked to give some tips for Slovenia. This might be one of the things they should take away from this presentation. Um, but apart from the coffee, statistics about the Swedish civil society. 89% stands for the number of people who are members of a non-profit organization. That's 89% of the population. Swedes, we are about 10 million people today. 53% is the number of people who work for nonprofit organizations, to invest their time <coughs> in nonprofit organizations. About 17.8 million memberships in Sweden. We have 17.8 million memberships and 10 million people. So most of people are engaged in or members of more than one organization. 25% of all of those who are active are elected representatives. So not only standing in the cafeteria or doing small work, but are actually committing themselves uh, into running for positions. Um, it's supposed to be 1.8 and not 2.8, but that's the number of memberships uh, per person in our country. So as you see, we are a very, very engaged uh, people. Lots of us uh, do uh, deal with nonprofits on a daily basis. To be uh, clear, nonprofits also uh, involve lots of uh, um, sports organizations. So it's not just civil society, but also the sports community, which is very active, especially on a local level in Sweden. And uh, I think, let's see how we go. Why is the civil society so strong in Sweden? How come we have 17.8 million memberships in our country? I think there was a survey made last year about this. Uh, and of course, it, it comes from great interest from many researchers, sociologists, scholars. What is special about the Scandinavian model or the Swedish model? The main reason that people said was the sense of belonging. It's the main, number one main reason why people engage. To have a part of a, something bigger than yourself, to meet friends, to be social, uh, and really ensure the sense of belonging. Um, it has, the Swedish, uh, the Swedish civil society has a very, very strong connection to the Swedish welfare state. The welfare state has enabled the civil society not only to focus on consumer uh, versions of civil society, you know, handing, like taking care of elderly or uh, ensuring uh, soup kitchens for, for poor people or taking care of children, but really to enable people to be producers of their own uh, activities and their own culture or political affairs. 
Um, we have a saying called folkrörelse, which roughly translates to people's movement or uh, people's engagement uh, movement. It stems from the social democratic uh, history where people would get engaged on a local level in their parties, but basically not only with political stuff, but with very many social activities. And one of the main and the biggest historical uh, movements of Sweden is the sobriety movement. So the non-alcoholic uh, um, drinking movement. It was very, very big for a very, very long time in Sweden. They have lots and lots and lots uh, of money and funds still, and they still fund big parts of, of the development of, of uh, civil society in Sweden. And they fund something that's called people's education that's connected to it, connected to this people's movement. It's not a system of um, formal education where, like in school, but it's a peer learning system where you have study circles where people would meet and they would get funds for exchanging ideas and exchanging on, on every single topic that you can imagine. So if you and your friends want to learn a bit about ceramics, you could go to this uh, people's education organizations and they would help you create a, a study circle and, and you would also get funds for it. Uh, and I think this historic uh, situation with the uh, sort of engagement and possibility to really develop uh, civil society organizations and the, and the active discussion about life, society in general, is a very, very important backbone for the Swedish civil society on a local level today. Um, like I said, we also have very active um, uh, sports clubs uh, or sports organizations, which were, who also take a great uh, responsibility for more than just, you know, training kids in football or basket or whatever it could be. We have very socially engaged um, organizations, sports organizations. So for example, during the fall of 2015, when Sweden uh, received a massive amount of, of refugees and immigrants, um, there's a new report saying that for in over 500 local organizations, new, or new, um, new activities for newly arrived refugees started. It uh, reached over 27,000 uh, refugees that fall, and it uh, encouraged and enabled 900 leaders uh, to be a part of this movement. So it's also a very important factor to think, I think, for the, for the organizations in Sweden. How can we be social in the things that we already do? So not only we have to become a party political person in order to inflict change, but I can inflict change in the place where I stand, whereas it, if it's with football or nature uh, or climate. Other things that are very well supported in Sweden is youth organizations. There's a big uh, support from uh, state actors and local actors for youth organizations to form, which enables people from a young age to really become you know, a part of, of this whole uh, coffee drinking culture of of the sense of belonging, which uh, I think is a, an important part of the fostering of democratic values and sort of the willingness to engage in civil society organizations. Because the last part is about politics, because civil society organizations also have a high standing rank when it comes to inflicting change and being a part of, of policy development and, and political um, advocacy. So. It's also really, even though you usually would go into maybe, um, sorry, even if you would enter a civil, organ civil society organization based on your interest, whether it's ac acting or sports or any other thing, there is a lot of policy uh, related to youth organizations that really creates a value so you can fast move forward and really get engaged in, in the politics, even though it's not party politics, with, and also meet um, with decision makers. So the decision making power in Sweden are very sort of open towards civil society, which is an important part. So 
the role of civil society uh, in Sweden. Um, so first and foremost, uh, when it comes to the role of civil society, I mean it's a fact that we are very well funded. This is one of the main reasons why we can function, right? And why we can have so many active people, because we're well fun funded, especially from a local level. Um, but I will get into the, to the funding part a bit later. Uh, the Swedish uh, policy about independence, uh, NGO should, NGOs should be independent, is a key policy uh, guideline for all uh, organizations, but also for politicians. For example, when it comes to the, the climate meetings, the Swedish NGO delegate, delegates wouldn't be a part of the official delegation, the Swedish official delegation, because NGOs are not supposed to be a part of a party political movement. But they would be consulted and they would meet with the responsible ministers weeks ahead in order to inflict their views. Uh, so it's, I mean, it has pros and cons, of course, uh, not being able to be in the room. But the principle is very, very important. The principle of the independent civil society. But it's also, of course, a controversy because most of our funding, or at least a third of the uh, overall funding for civil society organizations, comes from the state. It comes from the state or local municipalities so when it comes to local organizations. So it's of course a balancing act and some organizations have decided to opt out of the, of the state support but the majority of organizations in Sweden are still dependent on, on state support. But the thing, uh, the difference here is that uh, the state support is not divided by any parties or politicians. The separation of power and state is it's very, very crucial in this matter where we have ministries that are not run by party, like they're on a top level run by party politicians, but they're not governed in a party political way. So even if we would have a right wing government or a left wing government, the principles wouldn't change so fast. Um, we have an institutional role in policy development. There's something called remissrunda, which is a very uh, sort of technical term in Swedish, but it's basically institutionalized um, consultation processes for new policy development, for new laws, for budgetary measures. Um, but as I said, I will get into the financial stuff in a bit. Um, and then we have the consumer or producer role. So traditionally, before the welfare state was developed in Sweden, civil society had a big role in the consumer side of civil society, uh, um, like delivering consumer goods or services to the Swedish people. Where there was sort of youth clubs or uh, support for elderly or elderly care and food uh, and stuff like this. With the building of wel the welfare state, lots of this responsibility ended up laying on the government side. So the civil society could focus on the producer to enable young people or to, be, to enable citizens in being producer of their own uh, activities in their own organizations on policy advocacy and spending the money and time on, on other things than consumer goods, which of course are still important, but were so important to the Swedish people that they were forced into the public, uh, public spending machine. But the welfare state is also being reduced in Sweden. Since the economic crisis, since um, 2008, we've seen that the welfare state has started functioning very differently in Sweden as well. And we're now moving back towards uh, the consumer uh, side of, of civil society. And this is one of the challenges that we are facing. Um, but I will also get back to that in the end of the presentation. So, about the financial stuff. This is, I think, one of the things that, as I said, is the true backbone to why civil society in Sweden is highly organized and, and active. And one of the things that is the backbone of most of our civil society organizations are membership fees. Even though they're usually not high, since we have so many members, and many organizations have so many members, they still accumulate to a big part <coughs> of civil society organizations' funding. Um, 
And this, of course, is the funding that's also completely independent. This is not project funding or state funding, but it's a very important part of, of the organization's um, sort of financial contributions. Uh, we have public support from a national level, especially towards youth organizations or organizations that work with marginalized groups in, in different ways. Um, but I think the real power lays in the local funding. When it comes to creating a new organization or a new initiative or um, having activities on a local level, there are very good systems in place for you to get uh, activity funding. So each time you meet, you register the amount of people that you have in, in the same room, what activity you did, you hand it into the municipality and you get a, a contribution for that. So the more, the more active you are and the more members you have, the more active members you have, the more funding you would get. It creates an incentive of developing and then expanding. There are of course also uh, backsides to this and it's mainly developed through sort of a, uh, an idea of supporting um, sports organizations and not sort of youth organizations or civil, civil society organizations. But it's still an important backbone, especially for young people when they want to create their first organization. We have the study circles, as I talked about already from the beginning, um, where you could get funding for um, trying out new things uh, with your friends or discussing world politics uh, or anything else that you could come up with. Um, another part of, of the Swedish uh, financial system for civil society is aid. We have a big aid budget that also uh, in large parts goes to civil society organizations in order for them to spread the money to the relevant actors in different countries. So we have a big uh, sort of cooperation between aid uh, the the aid ministry, or uh, how you would say it in English, and the civil society organizations that work with especially north-south issues, climate issues, uh, and so forth. And then of course it's the project funding, and like all civil society organizations, uh, the Swedish civil society, uh, like all civil society organizations in Europe, the Swedish uh, civil society also struggles with the amount of project funding that uh, we are relying on. Uh, and it's a problem uh, because the long-term uh, effects and the long-term and sustainable uh, uh, projects or ideas and activities are limited by the fact that you have to be innovative and invent new projects uh, every three years. Uh, but it is a big backbone of the Swedish society's financial support. But then again, it's also the political side of things, right? It's not only the financial side, it's also the political side. And the biggest part is the uh, consultations. So Swedish civil society are in an orga organized way consult uh, consultated in policy decision making from especially a national level. It's uh, a way where uh, civil society organizations would meet with their ministries uh, to consult on, for example, um, since I'm coming from the youth sector, on the new youth law that was developed uh, a few years back. We met with the government representatives over the uh, five times over the course of one year just to gather inputs, but also received then a, a, a written version that we could comment on and all civil, si civil society organizations could comment on the draft law. So it's a way of really engaging and ensuring ownership of the, of the policies that we have in Sweden also within the civil society. Of course, it doesn't always go as we want, and we, it's not like they, we can just tick the boxes, but it's a institutionalized, whoa, really? Okay, I only have five minutes left. Uh, but it's an institutionalized way um, for civil society to have an, a direct link and impact on uh, the politics in Sweden. Okay, I will move forward. Um, Youth work is also an important part about sort of uh, enabling and uh, encouraging uh, youth organizations and young people to get organized. We have a highly developed uh, system of uh, youth clubs and sort of uh, youth uh, sector who's really encouraging young people to trying to be these producers of their own uh, organizations and free time and standing up for themselves. 
uh, and the present politicians. Education comes back to these study circles that I was uh, talking about before. Okay, so shrinking space for civil society. It looks, of course, very different in Sweden than Hungary and Turkey. We have very different preconditions, um, but Sweden does have its own challenges and, and uh, uh, obstacles to overcome. We have a declining or shrinking welfare state that really puts the civil society organizations in a new uh, uh, role, so to say, but we also have more uh, sort of private funds or private companies who do civil society work. So it's also a, 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 an ongoing process to figure out what is the role of civil society when we have private companies who are delivering now education and healthcare, and what is the state role when the uh, public funds are not enough. So we have new actors within the welfare system. We are also in some ways uh, victims of our own success or the fact that uh, civil society organizations have a big influence over Swedish politics and that there is a, a sort of history of institutionalizing the issues that the civil society uh, organizations work with. So now we have a political party that's purely feministic. We have the LGBTIQ questions that are also institutionalized and developed on a, on a sort of governmental level. Uh, so it's also a way of seeing how can we move forward from here, what is the next step for civil society. We also have new and innovative ways of getting organized, of course, the networks, the, the ways that we have uh, individuals who run uh, campaigns. It's also a way of s sort of questioning the legitimacy of civil society. What is it that uh, uh, the real people are really doing? Because the organized people are obviously middle class, high class, highly educated. So there is a big discussion on what is uh, really uh, the legitimacy of uh, the civil society when we are not able to sort of encompass uh, all this, uh, the, the classes of society. Um, this is sort of the perspective of the policy side. I don't necessarily agree, but it's an ongoing discussion in Sweden. Okay, so I was asked to give a few tips for, for Slovenia, and it's not a very easy thing to do from an outside perspective. So I will give you the same in, uh, advice and encouragement that I give to all municipal um, people that I talk to in Sweden. I think that we need to really, especially when it comes to young people, focus on uh, the producing side to enable people to give them responsibility and and uh, power over, over their own lives and circumstances. To ensure strong representation of young people in your organizations, uh, not just <coughs> as an alibi or to be there or to take pictures with, but really to ensure their representation in leading positions. And by that, enable people, and especially young people, to learn about the principles of democracy by doing. Thank you very much. Hvala, um, Ani Olin Papel, za tole zanimivo predstavitev. Slišali smo številne elemente, ki se stavljajo te trdne temelje švedske civilne um, družbe. A je morda kakšno vprašanje razjasnitve se pojavilo v mes? Zanima me, ali je relativno velik prihod migrantov v letu 2015, Kakorkoli načel uh, trdnost civilne družbe, videli smo prej, kako je vpliv ta prihod uh, množice dobuljca vpliva na Mađarsko, pa me zanima, kako je vpliva na švedsko družbo. So just to see if I understood you right, the impact of the uh, high number of refugees on civil society in Sweden. Is that more or less correct? Yeah. Well, it did, of course, have an impact. Uh, I think it also really showed the the Swedish society at first at its best capacity because of course Swedish government, Swedish authorities were not prepared to take and to meet all these people. I mean, in the, we saw it all over Europe, right? In the central stations, on the borders, people helping out, giving water, food, shelter for the first days. 
So I think that was really uh, also one of the ways to show that civil society it has a really, really fundamental role in, civil, in, in society in general, and that the, the state agencies or the municipal agencies were not able to respond as quickly as the civil society organizations did, and that really showed sort of the value of civil society. Um, it also created sort of a huge need for civil society on a more long-term basis in order to integrate and work with sort of language skills and, and society knowledge in general, which has enabled many organizations to sort of apply for funds and projects, uh, which has given them also an influx in, in activity in, in civil society organizations. But of course, it's also a difficulty because civil society is supposed to represent um, the society, right? And it has been a struggle to especially to involve and make sure that the civil society really does that. And I think it's a long-term struggle uh, for, for us uh, in Sweden now to ensure that, uh, that these principles that the civil society in Sweden uh, rely on also um, are also um, sort of available and accessible for, for the new people uh, that we have in Sweden. Is that a, an answer to your question? Yeah. Thank you. Lydia, a gente just focus on the organizer. Me zanima, glede na to, da smo svišali da na mađarskem ima civilna družba zelo velike probleme, na švedskem je civilna družba že dost močna, nekako tradicionalno vzpostavljena. Pa je mogoče vprašanje za obe in za Dove in za Anjo. A je možno, da preprosto razlog tiči v tem, da v naših krajih oziroma v naših delih Evrope še nekako nismo osvojili demokracije. Švedska ima že dolgo prakso v demokraciji. Je morda to razlog, da je civilna družba tam močnejša kot recimo na Mađarskem ali pa v Sloveniji, kjer smo si demokracijo začeli razlagati, kot kupimo vse državne, podržavimo vse medije in plivamo na družbo s propagando. Hvala. I think that is really a question maybe for you, Dora, to answer more, more, more than me. Um, uh, I, I can just acknowledge or reiterate the fact that I think that the Swedish, Swedish civil society is strong because in large parts of its historic grounds. Um, but also, of course, uh, that uh, Sweden is a sort of a civil or socially engaged uh, country. Do you want to... Yes, it a mic or... Uh, yeah. Come. You can also just share here if you want to. Yeah. Okay. So we are practicing participatory democracy now, sharing <laughs> the microphones. Um, yeah, I think what is really important in Hungary and, and what is a real difference is that uh, we usually refer to the fr uh, to the fray uh, to 1989, the fall, that there was some kind of a change, and I, and there were, I personally believe that there was a, there was economic change in Hungary, but not a cultural change, and people really uh, think that they experience democracy, but they they mix it up with with the freedom of market and and uh, kind of um kind of a feeling that they uh, yeah you know they have open borders but they do not have an open society so this is really important to know that that what is happening right now in Hungary is an education is is the start of an educational process um, education of society political education that people uh, really start to fear the um, the, the lack of uh, democratic practices in Hungary. For example, they are not really conscious, conscious voters, which is, which is surprising, but this is a fact. So there, there are a lot, really long way to go. And if we, if we add up, uh, add, add to it that there is no, um, so there is a, 
uh, controlled media, there, there is a shrinking uh, space for, for uh, civic uh, organizations and, and uh, people are threatened for being um, uh, critical on, on the government, then, then you have the mix uh, of, of, um, of an authoritarian um, uh, uh, of an authoritarian uh, government and, uh, and a really problematic civic um, uh, space. Can I just one second also get back to you on the first question? <laughs> just 30 seconds. So one thing that's really changed in Sweden, of course, is not the, the or that changed with the, uh, um, with the influx of immigrants that Sweden is seeing is the right wing populism that does, that has had a huge impact on civil society. So the Swedish Democrats is a, is a right wing uh, populist party that for the elections next year in Sweden are expected to have somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the popular vote uh, and it has of course uh, really divided the country and also had a big effect on the public debate and, and the way that the, the public um, discussions are going. So many engaged people, many civil society people are experiencing a lot more threats, a lot more uh, like a difficult uh, situation in their everyday life, especially through like online forums and hate speech online. This is one of the things that really, really has changed in Sweden over the past few years. And uh, that the discussion and the narrative is a lot harsher and, and the uh, society is a lot more polarized. So that is uh, like an, uh, an impact, but not from the refugees themselves, but from the society becoming more divided. Hvala. Hvala obema za odgovore. Um, vidim, da smo, da je zanimanje veliko za nadaljevanje razprave. Bi si pa mogoče vseeno zdaj privoščili odmor. Um, in potem po odmoru gremo zares v tako v panelno diskusijo, kot tudi v, imamo dobrih 45 minut, da res odgovorimo na vsa ta vprašanja, ki se bojo sigurno še odpirala v nadaljevanju. Tako, bomo kar začeli z drugim delom našega posveta. Upam, da smo spili dovolj kave, da se je naš procent odstotek dvignu, um, če bo to pomagalo pri, pri moči in um, odrejstovanju civilne in civilne družbe pri nas. Um, v panelni razpravi se prejšnjima govorkama pridružuje, pridružujejo tri novi sogovorniki, zato jim bomo na začetku namenili malo več prostora za uvodne misli, Potem bomo pa zastavili še par, bom jaz zastavila še par vprašanj um, vsakemu odgovorcem. In na to bomo odprli še um, prostor za vprašanja iz uh, publike od vas. Um, in verjamem, da bo to zelo zanimiva debata. Um, z nami je docent dr. Jože Bogrinc, lepo pozdravljen, Sociolo sociolog kulture medijev, profesor um, sociolog kulture in medijev, so pravičujem, profesor na Filozofski fakulteti in glavni urednik založbe studija Humanitas. V svojem delovanju pogosto analizirate trende v civilni družbi. Um, nam lahko poveste, zakaj je civilna družba temel, temeljni steber in brenik demokracije? A se sliši to? Uh, najbolj preprosto bi lahko rekli, da je civilna družba zato eh, vrnik demokracije, ker deluje politično. To se bo morda komu zdelo. Eh, nenavadno, pa eh, s političnim delovanjem mislim to, da pravzaprav eh, take skrbi, ki bi jih ljudje sicer morda doživljali kot osebne probleme ali pa zasebne probleme, jih artikulira, jih napravi za družbene, jih napravi za skupne. In je zaradi tega povezano s pojmom javnosti, kjer ni civilne družbe ni javnosti, ti dve zadevi sta med sabo povezani. Treba se sicer reči tole, zgodovinsko vzeto je civilna družba bila nekaj, kar so odkrili v 18. stoletju, kot um, tiste, vse tiste aktivnosti v družbi, ki jih ni mogoče uh, neposredno enačiti z državo. Ne? Se pravi, da je takrat 
biznis bil razumljen kot absolutno del civilne družbe. Vendar, ne, to je bilo v času, ko so, ko še ni bilo mednarodnih korporacij, ne, ampak ko so ljudje pravzaprav izražali svoja mnenja, ne, javna kot osebe v časopisih, ki so dejansko bili nekaj, bi rekel, majhnega, obladljivega, bistveno bliže navadnim ljudem kot vladi. Danes vsega tega ne moramo imeti za civilno držbo, se pravi problem imamo v tem, da je sodobna država in predvsem pa, da je globalni velik kapital postal neobladljiv za navadne ljudi, tako da, da ko rečemo, in na začetku danes ne je bilo izpostavljeno civilna družba kot nekaj, kar je drugačno od trga, kar je zunaj trga. Problem je v resnici to, da to, kar nam neoliberalna ideologija kot trg ponuja, je samo eufemizm za zelo grob globalni kapitalizm mednarodnih korporacij, finančnega kapitala, povezan ga z deli oblasti. Medtem, ko je država nekaj, kar večina politikov danes razume kot tehnologijo vladanja, če jo tako rečem. Se pravi, tisto, če moramo rečemo politika v navadnem pomenu besede, deluje popolnoma apolitično, antipolitično. Zato je spet je tisti del civilne družbe, ki deluje zunaj, bi rekel, ali pa neodvisno od trga, tista civilna družba, v kateri je danes mogoče v resnici govoriti, bi rekel, s pozitivnim predznakom kot v civilnem trgu. Kako pa vidite, kakšen je pa pomen, kakšna je škoda krčenja? ravno te civilne družbe, oziroma tega segmenta, mogoče tako kot ste omenili, za celostno družbo. Ta segment so v resnici v socialističnih družbah ni dobro razvil, zaradi tega, ker je bil, socialistične družbe so ga poskušali nekako preveč voditi, usmerjati in zato ni bil doživljen kot nekaj, kar bi ljudje zares vzeli za svoje. V družbah te postsocialistične tradicije se pa ne uspeva uveljaviti zaradi tega, ker je pod udarom vse splošne komercializacije in privatizacije. Korporacije danes pravzaprav lastninijo tisto, kar je bila nekoč socialna država, kar so bili nekoč elementi države blaginje. In države danes sebe razumejo kot facilitatori, če tako tako rečem, facilitators dela korporacij. Ne vsa država povdarjev. Bodte pozorni na to, da sprega med recimo finančnim ministrstvom, pa ministrstvi, ki obladujo infrastrukturo in kapitalom, se nekako obnavlja, ne glede na to, ktera vlada je, medtem kot na mnogih drugih ministrstvih uradniki doživljajo finančno ministrstvo kot tujo institucijo. Se pravi, država ne deluje tukaj le gladko, ampak v taki poziciji se seveda vsak interes, ki je blizu življenjskim interesom ljudi, zdi moteč tistim, ki tako kot recimo tudi, to se je pokazalo v Sloveniji, prav v primeru Magne, ne, pri državnih oblastnikih, ki sebe spet razumejo, kot da je trg neka prvotna realnost, ne, naddružbena, nadnaravna, ki se je mora vse ostalo prilagajati. Medtem, ko mislim, da je izhodična pozicija te civilne družbe, ki je tukaj le zbrana, pravzaprav obramba nekaterih popolnoma temeljnih človekovih in tudi družbenih, da se razumemo, pravic, do virov, do nadzora nad viri, ker nadzor nad viri je nadzor nad možnostjo 
etično sprejemljive reprodukcije nas. Ne, to se me zdi neka razsežnost, ki jo, ki jo moramo poimenovati sociološko. Ne. Etično sprejemljiva re, reprodukcija je to, da mi smatramo, da družba deluje tako, da bomo mi in naši potomci lahko zadovoljevali svoje potrebe na tak način, da bomo sebe videli kot koristne člane družbe in družba kot nekaj, v čem smo v temelju zadovoljeni, kjer, se, kjer, kjer lahko svoje življenja vidimo in razumemo kot smiselno. Tukaj je dejansko um, interes, ki ga, ki ga brani država, je interes, ki je strahovito megljen. Ne, obljubljanje uh, delovnih mest, ki je, ki je če malo vemo, kaj v svetovni ekonomiji, danes so te obljube absolutno prazne. Toliko, koliko je gibljiv kapital, toliko je gibljivo tudi uh, to, kje bo ta kapital investiran. To, da nekdo odpre uh, firmo v Sloveniji danes transnacionalno, absolutno nikakor ne garantira, da bo uh, da bodo tudi tiste zaposlitve, ki bodo mogoče generirale se iz, iz teh profitov, da bodo te zaposlitve v Sloveniji. Ne? Hvala za te istočnice. Številni mi se bomo še vračali skozi na daljem pogovor. Um, bi se pa zdaj kar obrnila še k naslednji gostje, ki se nam je pridružila v tem panelu. Z nami je Tina Divjak, pravnica, ki je zaposlena kot vodja zagovorništva in namestnica direktorja na Centru nevladnih organizacij, CNV OS. Živjo. Um, gospod Divjak, vi sodelujete ravno kar v študiji izzivov za civilno družbo znotraj EU uh, v obdobju do 2030, kjer je krčenje prostora civilne družbe tudi eden izmed poglavitnih trendov, ki ga opazujete. Um, kakšne so oblike pritiska na civilno družbo, kaj ugotavljate? Um, znotraj um, EU v evropskih državah in ali se te trendi kažejo tudi prima. Hvala in lepo zdrav. Um, ja, krčanje prostora civilni družbi je zelo uh, pomemben nevaren trend, ki je pa prepoznan pravzaprav širom uh, Evropske unije. Mi smo v okviru te študije, ki jo delamo za Evropske ekonomske socialne um, odbor, uh, v bistvu izvajali anketo, intervjuje uh, med številnimi, v bistvu ne samo uh, civilno družbeniki, če rečem temu tako, ne samo nevladnimi organizacijami, tudi akademiki, um, politiki in podobno. In um, uh, okrat Shrinking Civic Space govorila, ker sem tako globoko v tej študiji, da so mi te termini uh, bliže kot, um, je bil prepoznan kot eden izmed petih trendov, ki, najbolj, ki bi naj najbolj vplivali na razvoj eh, civilne družbe v naslednjih trida, eh, 13 letih do eh, 2030. Nampak, k- kaj se dogaja? Veliko smo da, že slišali primer um, uh, Mađarske, Kjer, kjer je v bistvu prvo, kjer je prva tak, recimo, država članica Evropske unije, kjer je zadeva eskalirala in vedno um, hujša je, kot smo slišali. Um, kar se je pa zgodilo doben, se si srej spomnim, da mi smo takrat 2014, 2015 podpisovali neke peticije, proteste, ampak nič v resnici se ni zgodilo. Ne znotraj Evropske civilne družbe, ne na ravni EU. Ja. In seveda so tudi potem si ostali uh, bratsko navdihnjeni evropski vladari dobili, uh, dobili veter v jadra in zadeva se širi Polska, Slovaška, um, Balkan itak, če gre malo izvene um, Evropske unije. To, to so recimo države Svodne Evrope, kjer vidimo trend teh recimo omejde osnovnih uh, pravic v smislu uh, svobode uh, združevanja, uh, uh, potem svobode govora in podobno, ampak ne gre pa pozabi to, kar je Anja recimo za Švedsko omenjala ne? in podobno je v, uh, um, podobno oziroma malo hujše se dogaja tudi v Angliji, ki smo, mislim, zive, ki demokracija, vsi se zgledujemo pravzaprav, cel svoje profesionalno moje, recimo nevladniško življenje, vsi gledamo proti Angliji, kaj delajo tam, ka, kakšne, na kak način podpirajo nevladne organizacije v mojem primeru in podobno, ampak kaj se njim dogaja, oni so omejili zagovorništvo v času volilnih kampanj, zato da ne bi zagovorništvo vplivalo na javno mnenje, na glasove recimo. Ne. V, potem ta teren, ki ga Anja omenjala, ona je sicer govorila konzumer, ampak gre bi so za service provision, se pravi za izvajanje storitev. 
civilna, pa jaz se bom omejila, bolj nevladna organizacija, ki je to bolj moje področje, ne. Pomembno je, da imamo oba segmenta tako za govorništvo, kot se veda izvajanje storitev. Ampak z ekonomsko krizo in z lean state paradigmo, ne, se pravi outsourcanje vseh storitev, nevladni, ki postajajo vedno bolj servis provideri, se pravi izvajalci, vrženi so v isti kož za podjetji, kar pomeni tekmujejo v javnih naročilih in te zgubljajo, zato ker pač infrastruktura podjetniška in nevladniška je popolnoma neprimerljiva. Hkrati pa jih država gleda zgolj kot izvajalce in ne kot zagovornike. Se pravi, so, ti pač izvajaš pogodbo, si zadolžen pač, ne vem, toliko in toliko ur za toliko in toliko evrov, ampak to je pa tudi vse nisi več prepoznan kot nekdo, ki poznate ren in ki lahko so prispeva k politikam. In tukaj se mogoče se zdi na prvi pogled, da je to pa zelo nedolžno v primerjavi s tem, kar se na mađarskem dogaja, ampak na dolgi rok je pa v resnizi situacija ista tako ali drugače, ti utišaš nevladne organizacije. In Slovenija je pa tukaj nekje na prepiho, ne, mi pa dobivamo vplive iz vseh strani. Sicer, dobro, bomo videli, kaj se bo na volitva zgodilo, a ja, to sem še mislila prej, ko smo se, ko je Lidija vprašala za demokracijo. Jaz mislim, da je zelo easy way out, ja reči, jo, ne, mi smo pa mlada demokracija, to je pa zato, ker mi še nimamo teh standardov in v resnici je to samo izgovor, ne, in na nek način držanje štange tem politikom, Ampak to ni vprašanje mladih demokracij, to je vprašanje populizma, far right strank, pa tudi far left, da ne bomo pozabili. Veliko krat govorimo samo o desničarskih strank, ampak v resnici so radikalni levičari tu nek pač drugi konec iste dalice. In ta trend je se v bistvu širi po Evropi oziroma po svetu, pravzaprav ne pozabimo našega prijatelja v Ameriki, kar ne da. In Se pravi, to ni vprašanje, koliko demokratična je država, kako razvita je demokratična družba. Gre pač za trend, ki vpliva na vse, pač zato, ker, ne vem, ekonomska kriza, ljudje so, ljudje so bili, ne vem, jezni, so bili brez denarja in so pač toliko lažje tarče za vsako jako propagando in se mi zdi, da tukaj je spet priložnost, mi smo se, civilna družba je pač v Sloveniji v preteklosti bila odigrala izjemno pomembno vlogo tudi pri osamosvojitvi in zdaj je spet mogoče čas, da se spet ponovno vzbudi, ne, mi je temo tako super v angličnem rečem reinventing civil society, zato da v bistvu ponovno odigramo svojo vlogo učenja demokracije, vladavine prava, da ljudi naučimo razmišljati in se braniti pred temi populističnimi propagandami, fake news in podobno, ker bi so samo to zavedanje takšne nevarnosti in nam bo pravzaprav nam lahko prepreči nadaljne oženje prostora, za katerega pa mimo grede mislim, da v Sloveniji še zdaleč ni ogrožen. Vse sicer so neke indici, ampak mislim, da še situacija ni zaskrbljujoča, je pa res, da če ne bomo zdaj trenda zaustavili, pa bo morda nekoč prepozno. Hvala, morda. Eden od teh, enega od teh indicov, kot pravite, smo se danes že dotaknili in to je bil primer zgodba okoli Magne letos poleti. In če mogoče niste vsi, nismo vsi seznanjeni, konec letošnjega poletja se je zgodil pravzaprav zares pogrom nad okoljskimi nevladnimi organizacijami, ki so kot tele sodelovati v postopku pridobivanja okoljskega soglasja za lakirnico Magnum Steyr. Država bi morala glede na Ahoško konvencijo zagotoviti do organizacije, ki poskušajo biti v teh postopkih, ki imajo pravico, da na noben način niso kaznovanje ali nadlegovanje. In septembra je tudi 65 tujih organizacij, nevladnih organizacij in vreš na predsednika vlade dr. Mira Cerarjo naslovilo pismo, v katerem so izrazile zaskrbljenost in obsodile te pritiske. 
Zapisali so, da so predstavniki vlade s svojim ravnanjem poskušali diskreditirati vlogo slovenskih nevladnih organizacij, ki so se vključili kot stranski udeleženec v tem postopku pridobivanja okoljevarstvenega dovoljenja. In med drugim se je tudi Komisija za preprečevanje korupcije v Sloveniji odzvala in odzval se je tudi CNVOS, ker ste ostro obsodili te pritiske in ste bili v bistvu prvi, ki ste zares na glas pregovorili o njih in jih izpostavili. Nam lahko samo nakratko poveste, zakaj ste so storili in kakšen pomen ima ta zgodba, ta indic, če tako rečemo, v Sloveniji? Mi smo se oglasili ravno zaradi tega, kar sem prej rekla, zato, ker je treba trend ustaviti pred rata trend, ker Slovenija spoštuje kao načeloma Arhoško konvencijo, je, ima zakonske mehanizme, nevladne organizacije imajo status, so del postopka. Se pravi, ta zakonodajni del nam načeloma deluje, je pa res za to, kar je Tina omenjala, kje pa smo, v čem je pa Slovenija padla na izpito v primeru Magne, pa to zaščititi zakonsko pravico nevladnih organizacij oziroma zaščititi nevladne organizacije, da bodo lahko normalno svojo zakonsko pravico uresničevale. Ne samo to, ne samo da je ni zaščitila v resnici, jo je zanemarila ali pa ne vem, direktno napadala. Pravzaprav, ko je bila dana postavljena v situacijo, ko je pač nek tu investitor prišel z kočkom denarja, je zelo hitro pozabila na to zakonsko pravico in nekako prilivala olje na ogon. V resnici nekoli ni bilo strani politiko in oblasti direktno proti nevladnim organizacijam, ampak problem pa je, ker je med vrsticami bilo toliko te tega povedano, da se je to nenormalno javno mnenje, ki se je izoblikovalo, v bistvu samo še kurilo. In to je pravzaprav nevarno. Mi takrat nismo ne iz strani vlade, ne iz ministerstva za okolje, ki je matica zakona in teh postopkov slišali besede v obrambo nevladnimi organizacijami in to je nevarno. In zato se nam je zelo, da je to potrebno povedati, nam je pa žal. Podobno, kar je smo slišali že prej od tega Frank, v bistvu povezovanje, solidarnost. Če želimo zaustaviti trend oženja civilnega prostora, moramo sodelovati. Mi pa takrat, ne samo da v bistvu Evropska civilna družba ne sodeluje, da se skupaj ne, ker to, kaj se zgodina Mađarskem, se v bistvu dogaja vsem nam, kaj je samo vprašanje časa, kdaj se bo prelilo čez mejo. Mi smo pa takrat tudi kot CNV spogrešali v bistvu da bi se na stran okoljačo, pa ne zato, ker ne gre za vprašanje, a smo mi za ali proti magni ali proti, ne vem, robotem, kočevju ali pa kakorkoli, gre za to, da branimo zakonske pravice nevladnih organizacij in takrat bi v bistvu morali vsi skočiti v zrak, ali gre za socijalo, kulturo, šport, turizem, ne vem, kakorkoli, gre za nevladne organizacije in tukaj se mi zdi, da moramo še mrzi kaj narediti na tem. Hvala. Ja, ponovno se izkazuje ta pomen solidarnosti, da res kakšno vlogo ima, ko se pogovarjamo o civilni družbi in naslednji gost, ki je z nami, bo povedal tudi več, kam se privedejo te trendi, če se jih ne ustavi, preden postanejo trendi, kot je gospod Divjak povedala. Z nami je Kemal, prihaja iz Turčije. Lepo pozdravljam, dobrodošel, hvala, da ste lahko prišli. Kemal nam bo povedal, kako pa v Turčiji civilne družbe doživljajo vse te spremembe. Tam je namreč tudi burno dogajanje in nepredstavljivi posegi v ta prostor. Kako se organizacije civilne družbe povezujejo in borijo proti tem posegu? A govorimo angliško ali slovenško? Mislim, naslednji teden. Ali naslednji let. But I have just five minutes because Tina told me then I have to be careful then I take some note about that actually to just making short and explain something because if I start at Turkey maybe 
two hours, it, it will be not <laughs> enough. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, uh, about Turkey, we cannot really speak about a successful tackling. And what we are observing is a complete colonization of the civil domain by the state, or rather by the government party. The, the civil society has never been strong on the, on the face of the state. Ali Bulaj, he is one of the journalists, actually, and now uh, and, and also Islamic intellectual, who is the behind the bar in Turkey for his journalistic activities, uh, used it to claim that there was no civil society organization in Turkey. All of them are civil society, civil state organization, is used to say. The civil society is the alternative of the state. A uh, powerful civil society restricts uh, the unaccountable use of uh, power by the state organs. Whereas in Turkey, the so called uh, civil society organization are in the fact acting as long arm of the state and they are adding extra power to the already powerful state. A good example are the mosques. The religion inst uh, instructions that in a secular society should be completely free of the state uh, intervention. Turkish imams are providing their congre uh, congregation both in the Turkey and European citizens, cities. And they are promoting uh, President Erdogan as the leader of the Muslim world. And it means the Khalifa, actually, it doesn't mean. And take the universities. The, uh, they should have been to inner castle of the civil society. The university presidencies are fully co cooperating with the Erdogan's push that followed the coup attempt at 2016. Academic preparing, uh, providing report to their uh, colleagues. The number of the academics that lost their t titles and jobs are almost 8,000. It means three times Ljubljana University, I think. I'm sorry. <coughs> So it is really a uh, um, huge number. It's not small, because if we just focus the number, but if we not just focus that they are academician and very important people, but they lost and job titles, everything. And also their uh, passport canceled. And uh, the situation in the media is even worse. One third of all uh, journalists lost their job in the last five years, five years. Only after the coup attempt, over 200 media outlets were closed. 200 media. This means TV station, the newspaper, radio, and everything. Their assist, uh, assets uh, were frozen and eventually Confisc confiscated, and still there are a uh, significant number of so called journalists they are uh, cooperating, cooperating with the government willfully and happily. This is not to say that uh, there are no attempts of the resistance. The resistance took three forms going to abroad, going underground, and going digital. The Turkish regime is still unable to fully silence, silence the digital communication means. Educated people use the WhatsApp and Signal to communicate, VPN services to reach to blocked websites and Twitter accounts, and several digital newspapers <coughs> or YouTube channels have been formed in the, the last one year, both in Turkey and in the world. I can mention some Özgürüz.org, Hala Gazetecis, it's mean we still the, the journalists, .net, 
and ahvalnews.com as three successful operations. As for the academic freedoms, the Kurdish lefts had already established the free university. Those and employment uh, recently established of university together with a German university and Koda University in the city of the Kocaeli. It is one of the city in the Turkey. A lot of the university lecturers uh, continue to lecture in the park, you know, the park in the street, and also in YouTube. Of course, this is unsustainable, but so is so is the dictatorship also. Yeah. A major problem is the is that you cannot uh, substitute the courts with the digital or underground courts. The ju uh, judicial system uh, is the backbone of the civil society and is altogether controlled by the president. It means Erdogan. Yeah. The same is true for the labor unions. In 2002, when the Justice and Development Party came to power, all of the nine major labor unions were left wing. Now, all of them are pro-government. You cannot create a private labor union. Unions work only if governments take them as their proponent. In short, there are calm, creative and innovative ideas to sub uh, substitute the last democratic space with this digital, underground or foreign uh, alternatives, but this is only a limited and temporary solution. Yes. Тежко сплоха сберем мисли по усем, кар е било изречено, кар е рез непредставливо и мора бит зело, зело тежко туди уздържат усе те притиске, че прав е па рез да се ведно изкаже да се најдејо туди канали, туди там, кар се зди немогоче, тако кот е Кемал описал за Турчио. Цивилна дружба в тачнем помену е je močna in zna oddržati, je pa seveda boljše, če lahko preprečimo to vrsto napade. Zdaj, ko še lahko, sigurno. Navezala bi se še na enega pogostih očitkov, ki jih v slovenski družbi slišimo, glede nevladnih organizacij, in to je financiranje. Se pravi, črpanje sredstev, Tudi seveda dejstvo, da imajo nevladne organizacije ljudi, ki so zaposleni in prejemajo plačilo. To je dosti krat kamen spotike ob različnih razpravah in debatah in tudi dosti krat očitek, zakaj pa nismo potem vsi prostovolci, zakaj. A niso to nevladne organizacije temu namenjene. V resnici pa je financiranje civilne družbe vse bolj problematično. Spoh recimo okoljske nevladne organizacije za svoje delovanje V Sloveniji težko pridobivajo sredstva od posameznikov in od podjetje, ker po eni strani tradicionalno nekako naklonjenost doniranja in spozoriranja je bolj usmerjena v socialno področje, po drugi strani pa tudi omejitev s strani, ko ga lahko prejemamo sredstva, prejemajo sredstva, da bi preprečili tako imenovano zeleno zavajanje oziroma greenwashing. In tu bi se obrnila na primere dobre prakse. Zato na vas, gospa Olin Pape, kako morda vi, ki izhajate iz družbe, ker je verjetno to manj prisotno, če je, kako na to gledate, kako bi lahko slovenske organizacije se s tem spopadale, kje bi lahko bili tej koraki. Seveda je to širše vprašanje, vprašanje celotne družbe, kako kot vse ostalo, ampak vseeno morda. Thank you. Um, well, when it comes to the sort of discussion of financing and stuff, I think just even though it might be more rare in Sweden than here, it's still a very prominent discussion also in Sweden when it comes to sort of the, the payment of staff, especially. Um, but I think it, it's, 
it's a matter of understanding the reality of, of, of the NGO sector today. When, it, when we're looking at the, the funding, like the overall funding, uh, and when, especially on a European level, where it's mostly based on project funding, there's no sustainability in, in the way that NGOs can conduct their work anymore. The enablement of having a staff, having a staffed office, uh, is crucial, I think, for the for the sustainability of the, of the NGO sector. Not to say that the sort of volunteer time and, 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 and this practice is not an important principle because it should be the core of our uh, NGO work, of course. Um, but I think when it comes to the reality of, of the NGO sector today, it is very, very important because it's basically a, a, a method of enabling civic <coughs> participation, right? Having a, someone, especially in the times of expert knowledge and expertise that we're living in now you really if you want to be relevant you have to be on point you have to be able to react quickly and and be very well aware of what's happening around you and to to be able to um ensure that you have that kind of time and space uh, for people to conduct themselves full-time or or part-time for that matter into these issues i think are are crucial what we, what we work a lot with in Sweden is that uh, even though we have also, of course, employed people and, and rights, we also have a method of, of sort of uh, buying time from, from um, um, non-profit organizations in order for their members, one or two of their members or, or uh, board members especially, to, to be able to free their time. So they have spe like a special, special circumstance that circumstantial deal which enables them to uh, receive limited funds in order to take time off from their job or, or uh, things like this. Um, but I d and uh, that's one way of looking at it and I think it's important because it's, sh it's still enshrined sort of the, the principles of, of the NGO. Um, but I, I do think that it's very, very important um, to have staff members as well to enable uh, organizations to be active and to focus uh, on on their activities um, yeah I'll be short right mm -hmm. um, hvala za ko to obuše kašno pod vprašanje kasne um, na to temo um, morda bi se zdaj še vseeno vrnili za kratek čas nazaj na primer mađarske ker smo se že danes spraševali ob Slovenija šla po poti te naše sosede Um, ker nam je tudi fizično tako zelo blizu, so seveda sprašujemo. Um, in gospa Pap, mogoče vprašanja za vas, pa vsem, kar ste že slišali danes o slovenski situaciji. Kaj menite, česo se lahko naučimo iz vaših izkušenj in kakšni bi bili vaši nasveti slovenskim civilno inicijativnim, civilno družbenim inicijativam in organizacijam? It's always it's it's, it's always uh, hard to to give advice and and to to understand um, what what can we learn from the examples and and also it's uh, really hard to represent a country uh, in these days where everyone is referring to as a as a bad example and we don't want to get there where you are uh well i have good news there is um, there is life uh, beyond the unimaginable um i mean beyond democracy um but um, bad news is that um um it's um it's really yeah schizophrenic <laughs> that uh, you try to support your country and you s try to uh, fight for for really crucial societal issues but um the environment uh, for that is not um, not supporting uh, <coughs> at all um uh basically what what uh, i would mention in a really short um after this uh, after this really short introduction um is uh, that um that you will always have people power i mean um you have to be in court i mean civil society organizations have to be in court in in uh, uh, in, in in society that's why they call civil society organizations and uh, in uh, in in case um, of um, of uh, all 
all the problems that have uh, been mentioned. The, the education of public is, uh, is always there for you and mobilizing people is always um, is, uh, is still uh, a solution. But uh, also, I would uh, I would say that um, that international that international solidarity uh, is also something that you have to base your uh, strategy uh, strategy on, because uh, that's what uh, really reflect on the situation, and it's a really good and positive feedback to to citizens as well that um, that they hear their case from outside. Um, of uh, the country as well but also referring back to financial situation uh, in case of hungary with the ngo law what i have not mentioned was also that uh, cutting finances was the first uh, step that state funded state financing was cut but also uh, the attack on foreign funding this law this year was about um, yeah according to the government it was about trans transparency but we know that it was it was about stigmatization and it was about control so um, a total control of the organizations and foreign funding is the last uh, last uh, chance that you have when you uh, would like to run an individual uh, organization so um, I think what what we can learn in the region what what organizations can learn and this also derives from international solidarity is organization of, of funds uh, of donations and and uh, trying to invite donors to the region to to guarantee the long run um, uh, funding of uh, organizations uh, here as well and and also in in other countries where we um, where we uh, can see the signs of uh, shrinking civil space right now hvala moram reči da se me je dotaknilo to ste rekla da je težko predstavljati državo o kateri vsi govorijo oziroma ki vsi postavljajo za zgled um, kako naj ne bi izgledalo oziroma kako to, to česa naj, naj ne bi prišli tako da um, so čustvujem in vseeno pozdravljam um, vso moč in vso delo, ki ga civilna družba vseeno opravlja znotraj Mađarske. Um. <laughs> um. <laughs> Če nadaljujemo, ko takole razpravljamo o vlogi civilne družbe, seveda ne moremo mimo različnih akterjev, um, ki na njo neposredno vplivajo in med njimi so zagotovo mediji. In se se bomo vrnili, vrnili na vas, gospod Vogrinc, Um, gospod Pap je že prej med predstavitvi omenila, da, so, da je v bistvu pritiski in, in omejevanje medijev bilo eden od prvih korakov um, vlade, kako si podrediti um, ta prostor. Um, tako da, kako vi vidite vlogo um, medijev? Um, kako, naj med, kako naj bi mediji ravnali v teh primerih? Imeli smo tudi primer Magna, ki smo ga že opisali, kjer so tudi se pokazale ene nove prakse, tako da je mogoče to... Um, Vaš pogled na to izpostavljeno. Hvala. Uh, jaz bi medije razdelil na recimo vsaj tri različne vrste. Eno so dominantni mediji, komercijalni in tudi tako imenovani javni, v resnici večkrat državni tudi še. Uh, potem imamo na drugi strani internet, predvsem socialna omrežja in uh, Konceptualno bi, bi, bi posebej postavil potem vprašanje alternativnih medijev, ne, ki se potem veže malo na to, kar je, je Dora Pap imenovala pre potrebo po counter-narratives. Uh, dominantni mediji, tako komercijalni kot javni, sem glede njih velik pesimist. Zaradi tega, ker že dolgo časa predvsem uh, nagovarjajo uh, ljudi kot potrošnike, ne kot državljane, kot atomizirane potrošnike, blaga. In uh, posledica je, da se jih med sabo lučuje. Celo v primeru Slovenije javna televizija, uh, recimo v informativnih oddajah, obravnava uh, svojo publiko praktično kot starejše ljudi, ki potrebujejo zdravila in se jim prodaja zdravila za varovanje in podobne zadeve. Z drugimi sedami obravnava jih kot 
en poseben segment potrošnikov. In tudi politika obravnava ljudi kot potrošnike tako imenovanih politik, drugače rečeno, združb, združb nekih akterjev v tem prostoru. Zato to je eden z razlogov, zakaj mediji, dominantni mediji nimajo lastne agende. To je ključna zadeva. Prednost, ki bi jo lahko imeli, ki bi jo lahko imela civilna družba, torej je, in tisto, kar je nujno potrebno napraviti, je, da ustvari lastno agendo, bojim se pa, da za to bo morala lastne medije si tudi ustvariti. In ti mediji bodo pač internetni mediji, takoli drugače. Problem socialnih umrežij, lete, je pa na kratko povedano tale. Vsakdo med nami svoje tiste informacije, ki ga zanimajo profesionalno, dobi preko mrež, ki so specialne, ki večine drugih ljudi ne zajemajo. Tiste informacije, ki so splošnega, značajo, da ko danes s klikom dobite kjerkoli, se pravi, pravzaprav smo se navadili in to je zelo slabo, da ta dotok splošnih informacij jemljamo kot neko danes. Tukaj so alternativni mediji tisti, ki nam pravzaprav alternativne podobe tega, kaj se sploh dogaja, dobavljajo. Tukaj imate pa specializirane organizacije, pogosto tudi nevladne, ki so pa pogosto nepovezane s nevladnimi organizacijami na področju recimo varovanja okolja ali pa socialnimi, za socialno delo in tako dalje. Ključni problem socialnih umreži je ta, da socialne umreže od vseh medijev najbolj prispevajo k fragmentaciji javnosti, tako rekoč k izginotju javnosti. Zakaj? Zaradi tega, ker tisto, kar najbolj zanima skupine ljudi na posameznem socialnem umrežju, so neka pričakovanja in strahovi specifični za neko osko skupino. In tisto, kar se potem širi preko neta v valovih, kot fake news ali pa kot nenadne, bi rekel, flash news, kot novice, ki v hipu zajamejo vse, so, to so nakratko povedano, predsotki in stereotipi. Se pravi, da mediji civilne družbe bi morali predvsem preseči to vezano zgolj na lastno socialno umrežje in zgraditi mrežo socialnih umrežij, ki si posreduje podatke in kjer mediji delujejo hkrati kot posredniki informacij, kot proizvajalci informacij in predvsem kot javnost. Na tanče rečeno, Mediji bi morali delovati kot tisti prostor, kjer lahko poteka debata, kjer se posredujejo te med sabo ločene javnosti in se nadgradijo v neko skupno javnost. In to sem pa absolutno pripričan, tukaj sem optimist, to se da napraviti zaradi tega, ker vse to, kar vi tukaj le delate in kar drugi delajo v civilni družbi, omogoča avtonomno agendo, ki je bistveno drugačna kot ta, ki jo najdete v dominantnih medijih. Danes v vsakem dominantnem mediju bi lahko imeli vsak dan televizijske in radijske vdaje, vsak dan poročila o nečem, kar se dogaja v zvezi z okoljem, ker se toliko teh stvari dogaja. Od delovanja vladnih organizacij preko na primer znanstvenih posvetov, političnega gospodarskega dogajanja. In to se mi zdi ključno pogledajte. Na eni skrati, tu se vračam, za sklep se vračam k temu upozorilu, da potrebujemo counter narrative. Se pravi, tukaj je ključno, da razumemo dvoje. Na eni strani seveda, lete tisti ključni strani, stereotipi, ki so recimo obrnili ljudi proti migrantom, tako v Sloveniji, kot na Mađarskoj in Marsi, kje drugje, večina tega so čisto preproste neresnice ali laži, 
In tega ne odpravimo drugače, kot v strajnim in dolgim delom, ki bo moralo trajati več let, ki počne to, če mor rečejo angliško debunking. Se pravi, treba je dejansko najbolj razširjene neresnice vzeti, analizirati jih, razčleniti jih se sud od prve do zadnje besede in jih soočiti z resnico. Vendar lete, to ni dovolj. Če counter narrative zrazumemo kot to delo zavračanja tega, kar drugi trdijo, smo še vedno omejeni na nek diskurs, ki je sam na sebi sovražen, omejujoč, ozek. In tukaj se vračam k temu, to če mora pa jaz pravim skupna agenda in kar je treba zgoditi, je pa ta pozitivn, lasten, pomen, kjer so nevladne organizacije in njihovi mediji tisti, ki oblikujejo agendo in to agendo je pa treba posredovati ljudem, ki se jih to dotika. Nevladne organizacije bodo imele efekt, takrat, ko bodo ljudje, ki imajo probleme z vodo, poznali in razumeli argumente nevladnih organizacij, ki se nanašajo na vodo. Enako velja za onesnaženje zraka, za globalno segrevanje, za izginjanje ekosistemo ali pa kar kol še hočete. Hvala. Se upravičujem, da sem bil dok, ampak to je tema, kjer mi je na srcu ležalo, da jo povem več ljudem. Hvala. Hvala za res odpiranje. V bistvu odprli ste novo vprašanje, neko novo, ne novo, povezano, ampak vseeno širši pogled na to vprašanje, ki bi samo po sebi že si zaslužilo kakšnega panela. Ampak, hvala. Ja, med najbolj neposredno vlogo na civilno družbo imajo pravzaprav odločevalci na različnih ravneh. Tako na nacionalni, kot na evropski, pa bi se ponovno obrnila na vas, gospa Olim Pape. Kako vidite vlogo vladajočih na evropski ravni, na nacionalni ravni in ali obstajajo kakšni primeri dobre prakse na evropski ravni, ki bi potem se prelivali tudi na nacionalno raven. Thank you. Um, well, yes, it, it, they have, of course, a crucial and a very powerful role when it comes to, to acknowledging, recognizing and supporting civil society. Um, what was said um, from the Council of Europe's Special Representative on Human Rights, I think is a very good way to put it, um, sort of that the state, the way that countries um, treat uh, and respect the civil society in that country is a direct indicator of the functioning of democracy. So how public figures interact with civil society really shows and gives you, gives you an indication on, on how democracy truly works in the country. Um, when it comes to uh, good practice on on EU or European level, as I work in the Council of Europe, which has 47 member states, um, I think uh, the the committee where I'm where I'm uh, representing here, the co-management has a co-management system, which really allows now in the EU sector, but still civil society representatives to be a part of the decision making processes of all the decisions of the Council of Europe that actually um, relates to youth and civil society issues. So I think w in, in this regard, in one of the highest levels of international cooperation, we've managed to uh, figure out a way where young people can actually have a say about issues that concern them, which is, uh, as many of you might know, one of the uh, statues in the uh, Child Rights, uh, the UN uh, Convention on Children's <coughs> Rights. Uh, so I think if that's possible on such a high international level, it should also be possible on local level. And I think that's uh, something that we should all uh, learn, that participatory democracy is a lot more than just being able to vote, right? But it, the, the scale is, is, is very broad here, and, and we could go much, much further in, in that direction. But for that, we need the recognition and support from, from local um, and national politicians. Thank you. Yes, the government organizations and the civil organizations have their responsibility or their power to be able 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 to be able
od spremanja novih zakonodaj do, na primer, izdajanja okoljevarstvenih dovoljen. Zato vprašanje za vas, gospod Divja, kaj lahko nevladne organizacije same storijo ob tem, da imam v mislih, da seveda ne morejo vsega same storiti, ampak kaj pa lahko za to, da poskrbijo za svojo varnost in uspešno delovanje v času, ko se na ne vrstijo razni napadi? Jaz bom si cel še za sekundo se dotaknila javnega financiranja, ker to je pa tema, ki meni leži na srcu. Javno financiranje ni nekaj slabega, ne vpliva neposredno na neodvisnost organizacij, ne samo, da je zaželjeno, javno financiranje je potrebno in obvezno. Država mora financirati nevladne organizacije in njihovo delovanje v javnem interesu. Generalno gledano v Sloveniji, če izvzamemo področje okolja in mogoče še nekatere, je to relativno dobro za to tudi poskrbljeno. Se pravi, varuh neodvisnosti, varuh neodvisnosti ni država oziroma to nas ne bo rešilo, da zavrnemo javni denar, mi ga moremo iskati in zahtevati, ampak varuh naše neodvisnosti smo seveda mi sami. V eni strani z diversifikacijo virov, zato da smo pač bolj neodvisni od pritiskov, da preživimo, če nam jih vzamejo, če se zgodi kaj takega kot Mađarska, predvsem pa s tem, da smo transparentni in odgovorni, da odgovorno porabljamo javni denar in v tem javno, ne samo financerju, ampak zelo javno in razumljivo, ne z objavo računovodskih standardov, ampak tak, da pač vsaka babica razume, kam je šal denar objavljala. In to je v bistvu tudi v resnici recept, kako se obraniti napadov. Če se sami obnašamo odgovorno, transparentno, kredibilno, potem je toliko manj, manj smo ranljivi za napade. Če pogledamo primer Magne, recimo, nekaj za tako, je bila umanotera, In je bilo, je pač je dobila tako javnega dnarja, to je pač ta, ne, fama, ki je bila, nevladne organizacije so oplačene kao v strani države, zdaj bi jih pa kontra tokle, kako si drznejo. O tem niti ne bomo razpravljali, ker nima smisla. Ampak je bil pač ta argument v manotere, je dobila toliko in toliko javnega dnarja. Ampak, in tu se je pač debata končala, nič drugega, nisi mogo razen, da si gajo pač posto na Facebooku, pa si šel domov k njej domov, ampak ko pa je bilo vprašanje e-foruma pa ali pa Adria Green, kjer so se odpirala neka vprašanja ali ne vem javnega interesa delovanja članov oprave, je pa že drugače. Organizacije v bistvu so bile ranljive ker so se v svojim ravnanjem postavile v položaj ranljivosti. In v tistem trenutku, ko ima javnost v rokah nekaj, s čimer lahko bi so pravzaprav preuprašuje, tvojo kredibilnost je v bistvu trenutek, ko si bitko že zgubil. Zato je pravzaprav naša skupna odgovornost ta, da se na tak način obnašamo, skrbimo za kredibilnost, za to, da dajemo čim manj kart, komorkoli, ki bi želel na kakršen koli način, ne vem, napadati, vplivati, omejevati delovanje nevladnih organizacij ali pa civilne družbe, se pravi odgovornost je na nas v resnici. Hvala. Če se že za trenutek vrnemo k solidarnosti, smo skozi vse zgodbe in tudi po lastnih izkušnjah vemo, da je pomembno, da takrat, ko se zgodi kakšen napad ali pa kakšno krčenje prostora, da imamo podporo, da imamo nevladne organizacije podporo v strani svojih uporabnikov, svojih podpornikov, ampak tudi širše družbe. Ker malo za to vprašanje iz vaših izkušenj iz Turčije, kako se vključuje čim širše, v bistvu vsakega posameznika in družbo, kot tašno vprašanje, imate kakšne dobre prakse, Vemo, da so bili primeri, recimo iz Gezi Park je bil tak primer, ko je začela mogoče manjša skupina posameznikov, pa se je potem razširilo na dokaj širšo podporo. Hvala. 
Uh, I would like to explain um, first the, what I take the notes, and then after maybe we can, if I still have time, then we can continue. Actually, uh, all political systems are based on the centripetal and uh, centri centrifugal forces, and the centri centripetal uh, forces are forces of control and centralization uh, is government, army, executed bureaucracy, are all centripetal forces. Uh, Opposition party, opposing uh, party, uh, media, academia, civil society <coughs> organization, and the uh, judicial, judicial uh, organs represent the uh, centrifugal forces. Actually, the government wants to keep uh, sensitive information secret, <coughs> and media wants to revile uh, it. The army wants to obeying the soldiers. The academia trains the uh, critical minds, when centripetal force forces are too powerful, the result is totalism. Then set, uh, centrifugal forces are disproportionately uh, powerful, the result is anar anarchy. A healthy society and political system is based on the working and uh, sustainable sustain sustainable uh, balance between these forces. The society has to be sensitive about this balance. When the government is exerting too much power to control the media, the public has to exert to balancing power. This can be simply protesting, uh, campaigning, buying one more critical newspaper, forward forwarding a message through a secure messaging up to open the eyes of others. This can be providing safe heavens for the uh, intelligence, intelligence that uh, persecuted. This can, this can take to from of peaceful residents. I will success, uh, suggest that things that should be avoided don't ever adapt to the language of the dictator. Of unfortunately, in my country, in Turkey, I can say even the uh, oppo uh, opponent groups have adapted the dem uh, demonization language of the president, President Erdogan. If he calls somebody a terrorist, uh, opposes the party also called them a terrorist and put a disdain to them so as to avoid to pressure, pre pressure and persecution of the government. Don't wait to the heart to come to your door. Yes, it will eventually come to you, but it will be too late to speak out then. You know that story um, in Hitler time, the, the priest, she said they came for the Jews. And after, and after, and after. And speak against dictatorship when it he, hits others, even if those others are not uh, subscribing to your uh, worldwide, worldwide view or ideology. It's now I can say about Turkey. <coughs> Actually, when Erdogan start the the purge, the, the past. Uh, some group, another group just silent. And you know, and first came for Tur Kurdish, and after came for the Gulen movements and Gulenist, and now they came to for come to others, but others media, nothing. <coughs> now 99.9 .9 media, all of the Erdogan hands in, in his control. And on the other hand, uh, I can say for society uh, organization and civil society, uh, have the civil society the between uh, public have the relation have to so strong have to be so strong because uh, you are you don't you, are, you don't have the powerful like the governments and you have to um, help each other. It's not. 
mean only the, that group or the, that civil society group. All of the others, civil society group, have to come together sometimes, some meetings, and because we know the, the for ethical rules, we can come for that, we can come together. And other sides, the, the media, so important. For example, now uh, in Turkey and other people, the citizens cannot <coughs> learn what happened. Just to show the TV, but other, just TV, that's just the, the, the fake news, just the, the <coughs> about the opponent people, say the terrorist, say the, they are working with the, um, the Israel, with CIA or something, and just people believe that. On the other hand, uh, and with the volunteer, this is so important, some kind of the, the maybe the daily newspaper or weekly or monthly and to publish or send and also to the listen to the public and to to go to the maybe door to tell the what happened and what can what yours especially what is your problem what can we solve that problem and that time after that time maybe the, that relationship it will be so strong to each other the source the civil society, the to public. And now, uh, in Turkey, yes, we uh, didn't uh, hope, uh, lost our hope, but we still have. And um, we need help, actually, uh, the from other country, and not uh, in, in Turkey. And, for example, uh, I can say, just rise up for humanity, nothing else. Thank you. Well, well. Um, yeah, po, uh, lepa navezava na to, da je v osnovi solidarnosti to povezovanje kljub razlikam v času, ko je kdorkoli um, v družbi napaden, da ne čakamo do, do trenutka, ko, ko smo mi na vrsti, ko smo mi pod udarom. In samo še Zadnje vprašanje iz moje strani predan odpremo um, razpravo. Um, za gospod Pap, ravno, ravno v navezavi s tem, kako ste civilno inicijativ, civilno družbene inicijative, vse organizacije, posamezniki, ki, se, ki ste se združili, um, kako ste premagali te svoje razlike? Kje ste našli um, v bistvu moč oziroma um, sposobnost, da ste se povezali predvsem na temu, kar vas združuje in odmaknili razlike na stran. Um, thank you for the question. I, yes, I have to be honest that um, it's, it's in progress to overcome differences. I mean, I don't have the solution, um, but, um, but we have to unite. Uh, in Hungary, there are about 6,000 civic organizations that are active right at the moment. And um, the civil heart that I <coughs> usually, yeah, I, I should raise it every time we mention Hungary. I think it's <laughs> like some positive things. Uh, so um, so for for this platform and, and also several other cases uh, in, in the last uh, few years, uh, not more, uh, not more than about 200 or or 250 organizations signed this petition that I mentioned uh, before in the morning. Uh, that uh, this this year connected uh, to the protest against the NGO law. Um, so it, it it is only a small proportion that that uh, are that can be seen as active. Most of those who do not sign petitions. Uh, most most of those organizations uh, are are really afraid of uh, being uh, uh, being attacked or being um, 
uh, yeah, being attacked by the government by raising funds, or or even even people don't really um, really understand um, in in a lot of cases what the problem with uh, transparency is, uh, and it's really hard to um, really hard to give um, uh, a proper uh, a proper explanation to society that it is not about uh, transparency; it's about c control over over the whole uh, society that we have a problem with um, and uh, but 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 turning back to your question I think I also have to refer back to uh, Kemal and I, I also have to agree that um, that the situation is that you have to fight back oppression so you have a, 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 a common front you have a joint front uh, in front of uh, in front of an oppressive, uh, you have to show a common front in front of a, an oppressive um, regime. Uh, so you unite. That's uh, that's um, a really um, uh, yeah. Um, primary explanation to that but in the long run these uh, platforms and these coalitions uh, basically change so we don't have the same interest we don't have the same tools we don't have the same um, um, mission for the future for 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 reaching out to people so um, the only way is uh, is a constant um, dialogue between people and dialogue between organizations and then I have to refer back to the need of of dialogue so reach out to people and what Kamal also said that door to door action so it's 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 never ending so it, it's really it's really a long uh, process uh, to go to people to talk to them and you cannot really skip this uh, it would be really easy to yeah I would like to skip this and have a uh, mass of people who who support me but it, but it, the, this is not the case how it's working so and it's also a lot of self-reflection uh, how we can act together I mean in case of uh, in case of joining forces you always have to um, see uh, what what is verse more my priorities or joint or the joint action or the success of joint action and uh, in case of uh, all um, civil society or all cooperation between organizations or or individuals uh, it's always um, the case of how m how many uh, issues or how many lives can be saved by working together and if you realize that uh, that the priority is always uh, always um, working for the future and for, um, for the future generation, then then uh, you can always rewrite your uh, priorities uh, in a while. So it's um, it's needed. It's it's a, it's a job. Clara, um, 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 skratka, odprlo se je um, veliko vprašanj, sem sigurna, tako da bi kar dali vam besedo, um, nastavite vprašanja na enega gosta, mogoče na več, okoli bo krožil mikrofon, um, tako da, prosim. Moje ime je Pavel Gantar, jaz sem, vsi se mi je Lidija Živčič poobila za panelista, sem mogel sam kratko pojasnil, sem mogel odpovedati, ker sem mislil, da bo danes na Kosovu sredoval v nekaj razpravi v parlamentu o civilnem nadzoru nad vojaškimi vrčevanjimi službami, no do tega ni prišlo, ker so organizatorja, zopravo organizatorji zdali zaporni nalog, tako da sem zdaj tu. Ne iz čisto neupravičnega zloga, ampak mislim, da vas to niti ne zanima. Vseeno sem rekel, da bi nekaj besed povedal. Zdaj ne vem, ki sem malo zmeren, koliko časa ste dopustili vprašanje, ker jaz nimam nekih vprašanj, ampak nekih komentarjev. Vsi lahko privočem par minut, ali je... Par minut lahko, ja. Par minut, dobro, to je zdaj, zelo točno. Kako je zgodi, dobro, sem prišel skos v prvi fazi. Najprej bi rekel to, no. 
Prva stvar, jaz se strijam s tem, da je magna neka predlobnica. Ne predlobnica zaradi tega, ker so se spopadili država in okolci in okolske nevladne organizacije na neki temi. Na tisoč temo so se že spopadile in še se bojo spopadali. To je popolnoma normalno. Dejstvo je, da je način, kako se je tu reagiralo strani države, ministrstva, ministra, z zakonom posebnim, s tem, da so šli na stigmatizacijo, ne samo na to, na igrani razlik, ne boste močvirni, ki preprečevali delovnih mest na Štajerskem, na igrani tega dvoboja Malibor, ne bi se zdržavali to reči Olimpija, Malibor, Ljubljana, skaj da je vsega to, ne? To je bila zadeva, ki je več kot problematična in seveda ne samo to. Nečesa, kar se jaz ne spomnim, ne v sedani demokratični, ne v socialistični obdobju, celo takrat se je bil premenat, ko se je to zgodilo. Celo jaz se je bil premenat in seveda to Jože, namreč taka stvar se je zgodila ob premijeri, rožancev je tople grede, ne, ko so ozaveščeni, recimo temu samoupravljavci šli na predstavo in v reku uničili ideološko neprimerno zgodbo, ne, in tako, to se meni porodila, ta ideja se meni porodila, ko sem videl, ne, ljudi, ki so pred Umanotero demonstrirali in prišli s svojimi močmi pokazati, ne, kako se zelo se ne strinjajo z tem, kar je Umanotero in drugi počnejo. To so normalne stvari, zelo nevarne stvari, ker se igra na prvo noto, ker se igra na prvo žlobo, ker se igra na čustva in tako naprej. No, tisto, kar se hotel še posebej povedati, ker vem, ne smem biti predolg, res je, ta magna je za mene pravzaprav predložnost, da se na nek način obnovi in tudi, da se spomnimo na razprave o civilni družbi, v 80-ih letih, v tem prejšnjem stoletju, vključno z razpravami, ki smo imeli številnimi mađarskimi kolegi in priznanimi znanstveniki, intelektualci, publicisti. In pravzaprav je zelo vprašanje, kakšne so danes možnosti avtonomne akcije in tudi odpora ali pa preoblikovanja nekih ciljev, predvsem pa odpora za pr neomenjeno in neuvirano dominacijo in prevlado določenih vrst interesov, lahko so zelo različni. In tu bi rad dal svojo prvo pozorilo, ki bo šlo mogoče malo proti temu, kar je danes trend razprave. Namreč, civilna družba ni pojem in ni koncept in ni entiteta družbena realnost, v katero bi lahko investirali ali pa umestili samo to, kar je dobro, kar je pravično, kar je sobodno, kar je tolerantno, ne? V civilni družbi obstaja tudi nekaj, kaj hoče le, kar ni dobro, kar ni civilno, kar ni tolerantno, kar je represivno, opresivno in tako naprej. Mi se moramo zavedati, da mogoče, ko govorimo o krčenju prostora civilne družbe, poklepajo strani država in govor koli, bi moral reči v temu, kaj pa če ne gre samo za to, ampak gre pravzaprav za nekaj več in nekaj bolj groznega in to je, da se pravzaprav v znotraj civilne družbe krepijo represivne in opresivne tendence. To, kar smo recimo videli, ko so straktori demonstrirali na Gorenskem in tako naprej, in še skup drugi. Ja, še čuril. Tam sem blizu, tam, zato se nisem spolnil tega imena. Skratka, vse te stvari in In to je, da ne bi vpredolg. To je za mene res problem. Kaj pa če, da je mogoče se kolica gospod Dora Papne bolj strinjena z malo, kaj pa če Orban ni razlog, ni vzrok za to, kar se vgaja civilno družbo na Mađarskem? Kaj pa če je Orban pravzaprav vtelešenje artikulacija represivnih tendenc znotraj Mađarske civilne družbe? Kaj če je pravzaprav se tu zgodil ta obrat, da je ta, in zakaj se je zgodil ta obrat, da so začeli neki točki v nekaterih elementih, začeli prevedovati ti represivni toni. Tle je ogromno morosti z analizo. 
prav gotovo je ena zadeva vprašanja kulture. Ne, če smem biti ironičen, upam, da ne zažalil od posebej ne, da bo spet pap, če si 40 let živel za ograjo, moče se si pa zaželil nazaj. In to je že toliko bolj absurdno, to pa je klično v Sloveniji, ker nismo imeli ograje in smo si vseeno bregu zaželili, čeprav jo nisem gled. Če bi lahko Mađarov še lahko ironično rekel, dobro, to razumemo, tega ne moramo nikako razumeti pri Slovenci, zato je ta ograja na Slovenski še toliko večja, večja sramota. Da ne bi šel k predeljšu temu, skratka, jaz mislim, da moramo to vprašanje razpreti. Ne samo na vprašanje, ne, kaj se nam dogaja z državo, namreč, če gledamo tako na polskem, kot na mađarskem, kdo je bil prvi cilj te populistične politike, o tem ne bom govoril, čeprav bi rad, pa vem, da ne zvem, v tem trenutku, ne, ne morem, kaj je bil prvi cilj populistične politike? Ne cilna družba, država je bila prvi cilj populistične politike, razbitje državnih institucij, razbitje, bi rekel, poseg v ločitev zakonodajne pravne in izvršne oblasti. To je bilo prvi, da pa da pravo, naprej da na inštitucijo sodstva, tako kot pri nas, ko se to vidi, je bilo prvi cilj teh politik, torej ni bila cilja družba, ampak država in tisto. In še le, če to razbijajo, bojo prišli potem tudi do jedra te cilje družbe. In tu se te zdaj vprašati, kakšne so strategije, da bi se temu, da bi to preprečili. Hvala lepa. Hvala, gospod Gantar, za nekaj minutni vložek. Zelo zanimivo in sem prepričana, da bo gospod Pak želela odreagirati na par izpostavljen. Orban is not the reason for shrinking it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, the problem for, for civic society. So, and um, if, uh, if the message that I, that I formulated here uh, was that, then, then I think um, uh, you are mistaken. I mean, I, mean, uh, I uh, constantly and, um, and really uh, I, I really try to concentrate on not mentioning him as as the numero uno uh, problem of uh, society. I mean, uh, the oppression that is present in the country uh, is, um, is has uh, has different components, and that's what my presentation was about, and that's why I uh, I call on on building a society, building communities, and, and also uh, uh, reaching out to other countries and other uh, communi uh, communi uh, communities constantly, because I, thi I, I, I think uh, that, um, that wanting back the fence um, uh, is, um, is a cultural problem. And it's not uh, not only the problem of, of civil society, but it's uh, it's a problem of several generations that had uh, so deep trauma uh, from from uh, from uh, decades back that was not uh, was not given a solution for and was not uh, given a given a treatment for uh, that we can see different layers right now in 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 this problem and um, and one of one of this uh, problem is that um, that people do not uh, really feel obliged to speak out i mean um, in 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 the society where you where where i'm i'm uh, really happy to share a mi uh, microphone that's that's a really good sign to be invite each other to the debate and the civil society organizations have the possibility to show a good mo uh, to, to show good model so i can list you hundreds of pages of problems that uh, the current Hungarian government uh, caused, caused uh, the country, but I'm uh, basically not concentrating on them. They have enough uh, time on air and uh, everywhere else. I am not one, uh, one paid to give them more um, uh, time and, and uh, more uh, space, 
uh, but I'm I'm really uh, trying to concentrate on the issues that uh, that their uh, governmental failures uh, cause uh, in in society. But I uh, but I think we also have to be conscious about uh, what is happening uh, right now okay. is uh, really shrinking towards. Um, um, dictatorship uh, within within the borders of the European Union, and back to the border, I would like to say just two more sentences. Is that basically it's o it's always a reason that uh, I am too young to to know uh, what was positive about uh, the border back then, uh, but I think it's not it's also not uh, the difference between uh, my experience and and the experience of an of another generation but I think it's also uh, the question of uh, putting in, uh, integrity and uh, and, inclu and including people into a community first and not concentrating on on uh, pr uh, protecting ourselves from something that is not uh, really uh, uh, existing I mean um, we don't have any other choice just to just to uh, form a community beyond uh, borders. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Glede vprašanja medijev oziroma prenosa informacij, pa ne bo dame enokrat prefleksijo. Pred nekaj meseci sem se dlje časa posvetil branju literature o problemu socialnih omreži in sicer glede problema filtriranja vsebin. Približno spo mlade tega leta sem po osmi, deveti letih rabe Facebooka končal s Facebookom, Zato, ker mi je prikazoval stalno 14-15 prijateljev, ne glede na to, kar sem komuniciral, kaj sem delil, vedno iste ljudi. Čeprav formalno je bilo prijateljev 200. Torej, zavedal sem se, kako me zapira v nek mali krok ljudi, s katerimi živo debatiramo, dolge razprave imamo, ampak tega ne vidi nihče zunaj naših odmevnih komor. Mi pa se vsi otrujamo ob tem, kako zelo argumentiramo, kako zelo se posvečamo javni razpravi. In zaradi tega sem postal takrat zadržan do društvenih medijev, potem si jih pa začel strokovno preočevati. Sem filozof po izobrazbi. In ena od stvari, ki jih opažam, je, da so aplikacije, predvsem Facebook, na njega sem se zasredotočil, ampak druge so podobne, te aplikacije so narejene na način, da nam nudijo ogromno zadovoljstva pri tem, ko smo dolgo tam. Torej, čim dlje časa moramo biti tam, zato, da lahko čim več oglasov nam prodajo, da lahko čim več zvejo o nas, da nam bojo prodali ravno prave oglase. In to je zelo nevarno za civilno družbo, zaradi tega, ker se nam tvorijo tudi zeleni mehurčki, podobno pri okoli varstvenih, ki govorim. Torej, lahko so tudi socialni mehurčki, socialistični mehurčki, mehurčki ljudi, ki zanima človeke upravice in tako naprej. Ampak tvorijo se eni mehurčki, daje nam občutek, da smo civilna družba, da smo angažirani, da objavljamo najbolj kritične novice svetovno. Hkrati smo pa tako bolj zaprti v zasebno, kot bi bili, če bi ti isti pogovori potekali ob tabornem ognju. Torej, dejansko ti pogovori potekajo v krogu manj kot 30 ljudi, dajo pa nam občutek, da naslišli cel svet. In tu vidim veliko nevarnost, če se civilna družba odpove ideji javnih medijev in javne komunikacije in prostora, kjer stotine tisoče ljudi, recimo v Sloveniji, skupaj premišljuje eno temo. To je javno. In socialne obreže nam pa to odzamejo. Fragmentirajo nas na tisoče, na deset tisoče malih mehurčkov po 20-30 ljudi, kjer se živo prepiramo s podobnimi mislečimi o posameznih otenkih. Tako da vidim velik izziv o tem, kako v času družbenih omrežji, kjer ljudje več ur dnevno preživijo na internetu, kot pa za televizijo, kar je bilo nekoč slabo, kako voditi javne razprave, razprave o skupnem. Včasih je bil temelj problem Slovenije razdeljenost na rdeče in črne, torej na dva velika pola. Danes se bojim, da je problem 
razdeljenost družbe na 100 tisoče majhnih kropcev po 30 ljudi in nič časa, nič minut v dnevu, ko bi teh 100 tisoč ljudi premišljevalo eno isto temo v naši skupnosti. To me zelo skrbi in ne verjamem, da je rešitev v mediju civilne družbe, ker bo to samo en morda malo večji mehurček, ki bo vključeval morda pa 2000-3000 tisoč ljudi iz širše družbe okoljskih nevladnih organizacij. Mislim, da moramo vsi skupaj najti način, kako nazaj do javnega komuniciranja, kako osvojiti razprave, ki jih krati prišljuje več sto tisoč ljudi. Hvala. No, kar zadeva te občutke, kaj se dogaja, se seveda popolnoma z vami strinjam, kar se pa tiče javnih medijev, mogoče vas je moj povdarek nekoliko zapeljal. Jaz se apsolutno strinjam, kar potrebujemo je javni medij. Zdajte, moj očitek tako imenovanim javnim medijem je, da ne upravljajo te funkcije. Ne mislim pa tudi, da bojo začeli upravljati samo zaradi tega, ker jim bomo rekli, ne upravljate te funkcije. Jaz to že dolgo razlagam, me popolnoma ignorirajo. Radi me pokličajo na televizijo tudi na tako temo, kot je danes, ampak da bi pa govoril o medijih, zlasti pa o njihovem mediju, niti podrazno. Se pravi, jaz samo mislim, da kako re mogoče ta teza zgleda radikalna v tem smislu, da jo je težko vresničiti, da je bolj realno pričakovati nastanek javnega medija, kakršnega zares rabimo, kot nadgradnjo socialnih omrežji, kot mrežo omrežje, kot pa pričakovati, da se bodo javni mediji taki kot so spremenili. Zaradi tega, ker prvič večina medijev je privatizirani. Ti mediji služijo zasebnim komercijalnim interesom, večinom. In prej sem dal zgled, vsaj kar zadeva slovensko televizijo, se njeni informativni mediji vedejo, kot da so, kot da je to komercijalni mediji. Mediji danes, povdarjam, njihova, mediji danes vstopajo preko oglaševanja v družbeni prostor, kot del ekonomije na ta način, da so pravzaprav, jaz ti mu rečem, ideološki aparat kapitala, naravnost kapitala, mimo države. Ko je Altiser govoril o državi, pa o državnih aparatih, pardon, o ideoloških aparatih države, je pravzaprav mislil na civilno družbo oziroma na družbeno reprodukcijo. Na to, da pravzaprav se družbena razmerja taka, kakršna so, se obnavljajo veliko bolj preko našega vsakdanjega življenja, se pravi, pred civilne družbe v širokem pomenu besede, kot je Pavle Gantar govoril, kot pa preko neke, bi rekel, propagandne dejavnosti države ali karkoli podobnega. Javni mediji so se svojo agendo na vides, držijo problemov, ki so skupni. Politika, gospodarstvo in tako naprej. Ampak obravnavajo jih pa na način, kot da imajo upraviti se potrošniki oziroma kot da imajo upraviti z posameznimi, posamezniki ločeni popolnoma drug od drugega. Se pravi, punujajo nam identifikacijske vzorce. Ne punujajo nam prostora debate o skupnih problemih. Ta prostor debate o skupnih problemih je treba ustvariti. Na novo. Lahko tudi z reorganizacijo obstojećih javnih medijev, ampak tukaj bi pač moral se tega lotiti javni mediji sami, jaz tega ne opažam, kaj je zelo veliko te akcije. Hvala. Še imamo čas za kakšno vprašanje in repliko in razmislek. Ali je morda med panelisti, kdo ki bi na dosedanju debato še kaj repliciral? Dejan. 
tem pa naj spodobim nadaljevanje razprave z drugim vprašanjem. Nekoliko provokativno, to ni moje stališče, ampak naj povem pač to stališče, zato da bomo lahko do te teze oblikovali svoje lastne mnenje. Kaj če je demokracija z močno civilno družbo, svobodnimi mediji, z ločenosti oblasti, ki druga drugo nadzirajo, le en kulturen pojav, družbeno kulturen pojav severozahodne Evrope in je in smo nekaj desetletji verjeli, da bo postal to splošno univerzalen civilizacijski standard. Zdaj pa se morda kaže, da je le nek geografsko lociran zgodovinski pojav, medtem ko naj vsaka družba razvija svoje modele družbenega razvoja in morda je za države, kot so Turčija, Rusija, Shodna Evropa, Kitajska in tako dalje, da je mogoče tem skupnostim bolj na kožo pisan en drug model razvoja družbe in ne nujno liberalen model, ki temeli na močni cilj družbi. Naj še enkrat ponovim, to ni moje stališče, ampak se mi zdi v odnosu do tega stališča pomembno pogledati nekaj besed, pa me zanima refleksija. Pani ministra. Gledajte, jaz mislim, da se ljudje povsod v slehrni družbi, ko iščejo odgovor na svoje dileme, seveda najprej pogledajo, kako so se s temi dilemami srečali drugi, se prej vedno se odzivamo tudi na izkušnje drugih. Zaradi tega ne verjamem, da v svetu danes še obstajajo ločene izkušnje. Pomembno je, in to je bilo videti iz naše diskusije, kljub temu, da so problemi na najbolj generalni ravni isti, so situacije toliko različne v smislu nekih kulturnih ozorcev pa političnih razmeri, da jih moramo pod vsakem trenutku reševati nekoliko drugačno. Tukaj mislim, da je neka taka, da je treba pač preprosto se zavedati obojega. Isti problemi se kaže lahko skozi različne prizme in zahtevajo lokalno tudi različne odgovore. Zato, da pridemo recimo do do skupnih rešitev in seveda To lahko povzroča neka nerazumevanja tudi, ki solidarnost uvirajo. Na vsak način bi pa rekel, da je spoznanje, da Evropa ni ves svet, mora biti streznjujoče spoznanje. Jaz mislim, da je del vsake emancipacijske prakse danes še posebej v Evropi, to kot učitelj pač absolutno tudi prakticiram, je boj proti evropocentrizmu, ki ga večinoma ne opazimo. Mi se ne zavedamo, da ko govorimo o svetovni zgodovini, govorimo o večini primerov še vedno evropski zgodovini. In da nimamo najrahlejšega pojma ponavadi o, ne vem, kitajski ali pa indijski zgodovini ali pa zgodovini islamskih držav, da ne govorimo o Afriki, recimo. To je dejstvo, ki ga je treba sprejeti in jaz bi rekel tako, pogledajte, Jaz mislim, da so univerzalne resnice dostopne vsakomor. In ampak kako univerzalizm, kje je ta univerzalizm, kje so univerzalne vrednote ali pa univerzalne resnice? Ni še, mi jih ustvarjamo s svojo solidarnostjo. Bom povedal en pozitivn zgled, ta pa je z mojem nedosti iz socializma. Zaradi tega, ker je Jugoslavia bila neurščena držela in je bil del uradne ideologije, da smo se z bojem osvobodili, da so se z bojem Slovenci rešili iz ginotja, moji generaciji ni bil absolutno nikakršen problem identificirati se z bojem recimo afriških držav Angole za neodvisnost. Barva koževe, to ni vstopa na absolutno noben način. Kaj hočem s tem povedati? Univerzalno se ustvarja skozi dejansko solidarnost, dejanska solidarnost se ustvarja v skupnih socialnih bojih. Razlike, koliko so, nam lahko tle k večjemu pomagajo, da smo močnejši pol.
Thank you for the thought-provoking question. And I think it's a very, very important uh, perspective to raise, especially this part about Eurocentrism and, and the way that we see the world and act also in the world now and, and historically. Uh, but I, I think uh, for me, what still makes it feasible to talk about democracy and, and civil society as, as a good, but not <coughs> perfect model is then sort of the core principle of that people should have a say of what happens with their life. This is something that we can all agree on. And this democracy is the best, so far, the best model that we've managed to come up with in order to ensure that. But it's also a very, very clear thing for all of us that not all people have a say in how their life, life looks like or what opportunities they have, right? So it's also very, very important uh, to raise the question that you did and to reassess uh, uh, what we're doing and, and how we are approaching uh, our way of, of functioning in society in order to come back to the root, which is the fact that people should have influence o over uh, the course of their life. So I think um, we in also the NGO sector need to uh, conceptualize this and think about our role and how, how we can incorporate more perspective, be more inclusive uh, to groups that maybe we are not inclusive of today and to have a very norm critical approach in the way, in, in the way that we function in, in everyday society. So it's not only the, the states, the nations uh, or the EU institutions that, that have to sort of and increase their um, involvement with civil society, but civil society also needs to stand up for, for the individual rights and, and develop their our way of functioning in, in, in this regard. Um, Ez bi mogoče vrnila debato nazaj na to, kaj se da storitve, da, da nekako omejimo, preprečimo kakorkoli nadaljne eh, eh, širjenje, zoževanja eh, civilnega prostora. Se mi zdi zelo zanimivo to, da eh, razen v eh, povezavi z mađarsko propagando Brusla še nismo omenili oziroma Evropske unije. Um, k Evropska unija v recimo neighborhood pa enlargement countries v zelo veliko vlaga v razvoj demokracije, vladavine prava, človekovih pravic eh, in podobno. Ne, Evropski parlament je recimo izdal poročilo o shrinking civic space, ki pa se seveda ne nanaša na države članice, ampak na neighborhood pa na, eh, na enlargement in človek dobi približno tako počutek, kot takrat, ko Amerika izda Human Rights Watch, ki ne veš, ali ne bi se smejal, ali ne bi se jokal v resnici, ne. Ampak, um, uh, se mi zdi, da tukaj um, um, bi se morali pogovarjati o tem, kaj naj bi e, e, Evropska komisija v, um, naredila. Ne? Tudi ne vem s finančno podporo v končni fazi, o tem smo tudi že govorili. Ne? Uh, za, uh, um, imajo ne vem, ADHR mehanizme, uh, civil society facility, vse v bistvu za, za, za uh, druge države, torej podpirajo uh, civilno družbo v izven Evropske unije, v borbi proti e, e, vsakojakim e, zožitvam, med tem, ko pa v Evropski uniji pa pravzaprav se nič ne zgodi. Ne. So debati pa, debate o, o, re, o uporabi tega artikla se, oziroma sedmega člena um, pogodbe v Evropski uniji od zem glasovalnih pravic. Ni, seveda, to ne bo šlo skozi Evropski parlament nikoli v življenju, ne, sploh ne v tako kompliciranem postopku. Um, ampak Pač, če že govorimo o civilni družbi, ne, dajmo potem mi vsi skupaj vplivati na Evropsko komisijo, da bo začela na, na mesto v, ne vem, uh, Euro for Citizens, vsako jake avtobuse, ki se vozijo po uh, Evropi in neke networkinga in ne vem kaj, um, končno spet nazaj uh, uh, financirati uh, uh, zelo osnovne zadeve, se pravi zaščito listine, listine EU v človekovih pravicah. Sicer spet, pač kot nevladniki, govorimo o denarju, nič ne bomo prostovoljno delali, ampak sorry, od pač dobre volje se pa ne da že vedi pa kredita plačati, ne. In um, pač to je realnost, v, v kateri živimo in se mi zdi pač, ne vem, pomembno, da nekaj rečemo tudi o vlogi EU-ja v, v vsem tem, no. Uh, I want to speak about uh, actually uh, Hungary because that question also. 
when I look the the Hungary, actually I just see the the five years ago Turkey, and at that time also to the Erdogan said the people, uh, the some people they hate Turkey. Yes, they are citizenship to, of Turkey, but they are the um, want to stop to Turkey because Turkey has become the so powerful and uh, we are the. The, we have the big economy and we are so strong so other c the people or other countries jealous us why they is the opponent to us and uh, the time by time but at that time as actually the EU just silent 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 and when they start some uh, big problem like to close all of the media or something at that time just try to someone not all to speak some something tell something else but at that time actually it's so late and for hungary as i know uh, also now that going the same way because Erdogan how look the to, to follow the uh, the hitler's way and urban uh, actually going to i think the same way and to uh, for future, it will be big problem, and for EU and not only Turkey, uh, because I think the Turkey, the last level, it's mean last level, the civil war, before last level, actually, just in future, what will be, we will see. But as I said, and uh, so civil society group, organization, and other country organizations. And they cannot come together for, as I said, the, the ethics rules, ethical rules, and for humanity, and for really the, for, for better world. And also, uh, they sometimes look the, what are you thinking, and what is your idea? And I can uh, give the explain. In Turkey, many feminists group and civil organization and also the women's uh, society organization now they are just silent uh, why silent I, I don't know because now uh, more than 668 babies behind the bar it's in, in in prison in jail and more than 17 thousand women are in jail also but that that group, the feminist group, that women's <coughs> civil organization groups, they are, they didn't say anything, anything else, and they are under the torture and <coughs> but nothing because that person who who they are now in jail, their <coughs> idea is different, they are really re close to re um, religion, but I am. Feminist, I don't believe gods, or I'm secular. Why I will support them? But what you when you uh, sometimes you said you <coughs> better word. What you said the the how can I say human rights and the same rules. But why? Because different idea. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks uh, for for uh, <coughs> raising up again um, the issue of Hungary. I think uh, one of it's just a mic. Or, um, so uh, I think I, I just wrap it up uh, a bit and also um, a few uh, sentences about um, what is going on. Yes. Um, unfortunately, tyrants and dictators can learn from each other. That's one of my biggest problems. And I think most of the activist problem is that, that not just democracies can learn from each other, uh, but the get bad guys as well. So um, what, what we can do right now is really learning from each other and, and uh, form uh, form local communities as well and, and think on a global level. And yes, we we really we really fall into the pr uh, into the mistake uh, of um, of only seeing or 
or problem i i mean not not uh, looking um, outside the borders of uh, the uh, eu or 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 the country itself but uh, basically what uh, in in case of the the hungarian um, example can we can show us is that it is uh, it is not just the civic space because ci we are the citizens we are we are the civic space so that's what we should not forget in the long run that uh, that we are forming the communities that we are talking about and that's why we have to act upon because those problems that we are fighting right now it's education healthcare um, uh, economic struggle and so on and so forth and they will come back with time even if we even if we fight one tyrant uh, the, the the problems of of uh, and failures of the system will come back uh, um, this is a characteristic of, of, of problems that they come back by time by time and if we do not solve it uh, then uh, then we we always give ourselves a task uh, to in, in the long run to to be busy with uh, problems and not uh, looking forward to uh, solutions so um, I think it's really important to to take uh, a look outside to talk about prevention to talk about um, to talk about uh, the the issues that that we can raise together I mean for example the EU level and and le uh, legislation is important because uh, when countries act together uh, you can see that uh, it, uh, th those procedures are always more successful than individual cases and um, and also uh, uh, that uh, making citizens um, uh, understand that that uh, it's not a higher power that are going to protect them or that are going to act upon their issues, but uh, they themselves are the core to to solving the crisis uh, uh, of uh, society. That's the that's the uh, more sim simplest way that I can formulate it. Well. Ja približujemo se zaključku današnjega panela. Temo, da verjamem, da je še vprašanj in da je še razmisleko, ampak naj povem, da se bomo še nekaj časa lahko družili v predverju, tako da zadržite ta vprašanja in seveda poiščite sogovorce, s katerimi bi jih radi še malo obdelali. Mi pa predem se razidemo morda še gostom dala priložnost, da čisto nakratko povzamejo strnejo kakšno misel, s čim odhajate od danes, kaj je tisto najbolj pomembno, kar smo nekako dognali tukaj skupaj. Možda na kratko, v obliki tega elevator pitch. Ne, ne vidim, ne se ne. Da ne bomo predolgi, ker nas čaka pogostitev za naj. Tako da, kdo želi. Ne zdaj, mogoče samo, ker sem globoko v tem šrinkingu, ne bom o tem govorila, bi se pa naslovno to, kaj je dr. Ganta rekel, ker sama sem zadnje čase o istem razmišljala. Mi v Sloveniji o koncepti civilne družbe nismo razmišljali že 30 let vsaj. Razmišljamo o teh nevladniških prostovoljstvo financiranja, zaposlovanja, rrr, ne pa o konceptih, o razvoju, o priložnostih in grožnjah, če se se bat kaj izkoristiti in mislim, da je pa zdaj res čas, da se začnemo o tem pogovarjati, ker sicer se nam bo prihodno skrz zgodila, če sem tudi jaz malo populistična. Tako da upam, da mi razmišljamo na Crnevosu, da bi začeli z nekimi takimi debatami o vinu, v nekem odobnem prostoru, zato da se res odprejo stvari, tako da vas v bistvu za zaključek vabim, da skupaj razmišljamo pa odpremo neka vprašanja, ki se mi zdi resnično pomembno, da ne grejo za deve mimo nas. Hvala. Hvala. Ja, morda nakratko. Mogoče še nekaj, da ne pozabimo, ker je čez par dni ravno svetovni dan človekovih pravic, a ne 10. december, sama prihajam pa z varoha človekovih pravic. 
Pravica do zdravega življenjskega okolja je tudi ena izmed temeljih človekovih pravic. Solidarnostna je. Tega ne pozabimo vsi skupaj, ko to govorimo danes toliko o solidarnosti. Pa mogoče še nekaj malo sem bila prej izvana. Tudi tvaroh človekovih pravic je zelo ostro obsodo napade na okolje varstvenike. Ne na zadnje, na to solidarnost, pa povezovanje, pa kaže tudi to, da mi organiziramo redna mesečna srečanja z okoljskimi organizacijami. Srečujemo se tudi na terenu, kjer se pač pogovarjamo o tistih problemih, ki so še po sebi te reči v določnem okolju. Na zadnje smo bili v Pomorju, kjer smo diskutirali o namerah države, da zgodi ne vem koliko hidroelektrarni, kar se vsekakor ne bo vplivalo samo na tisto območje, temveč tudi širše na našo državo, kot tudi sicer povezovanje, sodelovanje civilne družbe, temveč tudi ostalih je zelo pomembno in seveda to ne sega samo znotraj naše države, temveč tudi širše. Ja, drži in hvala za ta dodatek. Še kakšno zaključno misel od naših gostov? Ni obvezno, ampak če imate še kaj, kar bi radi strnili, preden se razidemo. Jaz bi samo ponovil na drug način, jaz mislim, da je pomembno to, kar je Paul Ganter povdaril in kar sledi iz tega, kar smo pravzaprav vsi tukaj le govorili, da Če hočemo, da se ne bo civilna družba še bolj skrčila, je tisto, kar je treba narediti, tudi mnenjski boj, pa boj za duše, če hočete, je v sami civilni družbi. Ne toliko, da imamo upraviti, ne vem, z zunanim sovražnikom, kot bi rekli v nekem drugem diskurzu. Hvala. Yes, we had an interesting break discussion that I think we should also highlight, and it taps a bit into the, the discussion that we had also now in the in the panel. Uh, when it comes to standing up for rights, I mean, and solidarity, I think that's one of the main topics or um, ideas that I take with me from, from, from this morning. Um, but I also wanted to mention, I, I mean, we're uh, all uh, a part of the same movement, the civil society movement, no matter if we work with youth organizations or, or environment, environmental organizations or uh, whatnot. Um, but of course, within the civil society, there are also those uh, organizations that do not stand up for the civil, like the civil rights. Uh, and I mean, in Sweden now with, with the upcoming elections and the Swedish Democrats, I mean, th those are publicly, publicly elected persons who oppose a free civil society. And this is a huge challenge, I think, uh, for the future to also bring with us um, uh, in the discussion that within the civil society we have strong forces going against each other and we have to find ways and methods in how to mediate that clash and how to win back the people who lost uh, the belief in a free and open society. Uh, and especially when it comes to hate speech and the way that um, active people are now being threatened or sort of publicly shamed on, on the internet or addresses and, and photos and uh, phone numbers are being shared. I think we have to really think about how we can also uh, meet these new challenges of <coughs> being an active and engaged person. And this is a discussion that I think requires a lot of solidarity and like you were saying we cannot look uh, at our very close sort of uh, um, differences but we have to look at the bigger pictures and really stand up for civil and human rights <coughs> <at this> <coughs> Sam, just um, I, I would like to <coughs> agree with you uh, on on raising the topic of of public servants. I mean, um, I mean, uh, when we debate the um, the place of uh, NGOs and not just NGOs but uh, individuals who are attacked. Uh, the most, uh, I mean, what what really makes me sad is that those people who are paid by uh, taxpayers' money uh, attacking other uh, other individuals from from society, uh, which is uh, which is questioning the whole notion of uh, humanity and and being being um, in, in uh, being on the on the same platform when we when we talk about basic human values. So that's. 
what we have to really focus on in uh, and that's what I am also bringing home uh, to focus on more articulating uh, an inclusive society and not uh, naming uh, them and us but but talking about an inclusive community that we all belong to voilà. um, Um, tako smo prišli do konca um, današnjega posveta, ki je bil mišljen kot nek prvi korak, ali pa mogoče ponoven korak, um, če se navezujemo na celotno debato, kako začet se spet pogovarjati um, o civilni družbi, o njeni vlogi. Um, mogoče res kdaj ob vino, ampak zagotovo pa v bližnji prihodnosti še veliko priložnosti, kako um, te misli razširiti in jih še malo konkretizirati. Um, Ja, zagotovo je bila solidarnost nekako um, največkrat omenjena oziroma najbolj nekako povizujoč elemente debate. Um, in ja, upam, da odhajamo z nekim novim razumevanjem, z nekimi novimi pogledi um, oziroma utrjenimi pogledi um, in da smo se spomnili, da, da nas ravno te razlike delajo močnejše in da se tega ne bi smeli bat um, in pri našem pri, pri medsebojnem sodelovanju. Tako da bi se zahvalila um, vsem gostom in gostjam. Hvala, da ste prišli, nekateri od lje, nekateri od malo bliže, ampak um, zelo um, ste pripomogli k dobri um, in kvalitetni debati. Um, hvala tudi vsem vam, ki ste prišli, bili z nami, sodelovali, um, vprašali in, um, in razpravljali. Um, Predstavitve, pos, predstav, predstavitve in posnetek bo, bojo na voljo na spletni strani so organizatorjev, se pravi ima na tere fokusa in ekologo brez meja. Um, in bi vas v imenu organizatorjev, katerim se tudi zahvaljujem, da so organizirali in odprli to, um, ta prostor razprave, v njihovim imenu bi, vam, bi vas še povabila na prigrizek v predverju, um, kjer se lahko tudi še naprej uh, podružite, um, malo še razpravljamo, um, preden se vrnemo vsak svojemu Um, delo življenju in tako naprej. Um, hrana in napitki tako kot prej so iz um, lokalnih ekoloških sestavin, um, tudi iz pravične trgovine in uh, pogostitev so pripravili v Zavodu za državno raziskovanje in medkulturno razumevanje. Tako da, <laughs> hvala in lep dan še naprej.